Uh, so how is the tutorial organized? Uh, uh, we're going to show a intro to KGTK and Typher uh, in a second. We're a couple of minutes late for that. Uh, then, uh, you know, given that we have only a small number of people, I think Hans will have to do a poll to decide, you know, which part we do. Uh, and so it'll be either uh, profiling or extending KGs with CSV files. Then we'll take a break. And then again, we have the option between doing uh, link open data, showing how KGTK can work with link open data or doing embeddings. And then an another option is to show how you can do network analysis or the work we did to analyze the full Wikidata dump and also the history of all Wikidata dumps since the inception of the project. Uh, and so you will learn the, the tools and uh, hope that, that you have fun too uh, while doing that. Uh, and so Hans, it's your turn. So I'll stop sharing. Um, I think if there are links that you might want the, um, the participants to access, you can put it in the chat. Yes, I'm, I'm adding one link in the chat to access the notebooks on Colab. So I just did that. Okay. Uh, but then I'll also talk through that, you know, in the presentation. Okay. So can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. What is the present button? Where is my present button? Why can't I see it? It's usually on the top right. Uh, if you go, it's called slideshow. Um, I mean, you just um, hit the menu, but it wasn't on the top. Oh, there it is. There Sorry. <laughs> um, initial glitch. Hi, good, very early morning. Everybody here from- uh, I'm Southern sorry. You Go have ahead. the you have your you know your participants or the chat obscuring the slides. Are they gone now? They are in the corner. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if I can completely eliminate it. Um, all right, try again. Good, very early morning here from Southern California. My name is Hans Kalupski. I'm a researcher at USC's Information Sciences Institute, and I will tell you a little bit about the. KGDK uh, data model and the Kiefer query system. So this is just a brief outline, just a short introduction to our data model, which is very simple, a brief overview of the whole architecture of KGDK commands, and then a little bit more about the Kiefer query language. And most of my presentation will be uh, a hands-on tutorial that uh, you can follow along on Google Colab if you are so inclined. So the data model, this is just a, a repeat of one of, of Pedro's slides, but to just sort of hammer this in a little bit more. So KGDK is really designed to be as simple as absolutely possible and to give you maximal flexibility. And that's the reason why we chose TSV files as our main data presentation representation where you know, there's basically four columns that represent the edges, you know, node one, label node two, and edge ID column. And these TSV files are then the inputs and outputs to our various commands. And the idea is that obviously we have a large number of uh, tools and software available to help you with this, but you can actually you know, use this data model without any KGDK tools. You can just use standard Unix tools or Python or Pandas or whatever to manipulate them. So you don't really need a library to work with these. And it's schema free, nodes can be anything. And we have this set of structured literals that I'll tell you a little bit more later. So here is a, a very simple example, knowledge graph that you will see in various uh, incarnation throughout this tutorial. 
so this shows a little bit uh, of a snapshot of a movie domain. In the middle here, there's a node that represents uh, the Terminator 2 Judgment Day movie, which is then connected through you know, various edges to you know, actors, genres, uh, and so on. And here is the TSV representation of this. So again, if we look for the Terminator Judgment Day node here in the middle, that's represented simply as an entry in the node one column. And then there are various edges. So for example, there's a label edge with the label label uh, pointing to a string, one of the structured literals that we have. So there's Terminator two with an uh, English suffix, uh, suffix. And then Terminator two is also uh, an instance of the class film and has the genre science fiction and so on. And, um, very importantly, you know, we don't just have triples, we have actually quads where each edge additionally has an ID. You see these little yellow uh, circles in the middle of edges um, and they represent this relationship. And you can then say more about this relationship. So for example, in the uh, fifth row from the top, um, there is T4, that's the edge ID for this particular cast edge that Arnold Schwarzenegger is a uh, member of the cast of the movie. And then we can say something about the edge. You know, T4 also uh, has a role, what we call a qualifier. Uh, and the role here that he played was the Terminator. And this can be arbitrarily nested. These, these you know, edges about edges can have their edge at these uh, themselves. And you can say more about that, even though usually it will uh, terminate at about you know one or at most two levels of nesting. And then we have the second uh, piece of the data model model that uh, are the structured literals that basically represent the number of often used sort of low level data types such as strings, language qualified strings, date time literals, quantities, lat long. We also have an extension syntax so you can add your own types, for example, you might want to use a DBpedia US dollar uh, currency type. And again, this is designed for simplicity. So all these, you know, uh, start can basically determine by the first character what type of literal you're dealing with and the rest can then be parsed with a regular expression. And there's minimal dependency within KGDK on these types. So you can still use your standard Unix tools uh, to deal with this data. And here's just a brief summary to put this in the context of other knowledge graph data models that are commonly used. You know, so there's labeled property graphs where we have nodes and relationships. Uh, and they form labeled graphs. And the, then we can have properties on nodes and edges, such as key value pairs. But there's no nesting. You cannot go you know, and have then edges about edges, for example. There is RDF that many of you will be familiar with, where you have subject, predicate, object triples over your eyes. Only objects there can be literals. And then if you wanna say something about a triple, you have to use reification, which then basically requires you to have four triples instead of one, uh, because uh, you have to represent the statement and so on. There's this new effort called RDF star that tries to eliminate some of these uh, issues where you have basically RDF plus nested triples about triples without reification. And that gives you a simpler representation of triple properties and nesting. Now the Wikidata model is one that we've, you know, really been sort of mostly been inspired by. And there you have property value statements describing items or Q notes, and there's references and Qualifiers then can describe properties about statements. So this is you know, our edges about edges, but in Wikidata, there's no nesting. This only goes one level deep. And finally, there's KTDK. We have quad-based edges with ID node one, label, and node two. Anything can be a node or label. Arbitrarily nesting is possible using IDs as nodes. And you know, below is a URI that points you to a a description of our data model on our documentation site. Um, so KGDK is a toolkit. It has a large, very large number of commands. And here's just a little uh, cartoon sort of abstracting this. So on the left, there's a number of different import commands to allow you to extract data from common formats such as Wikidata, DBpedia, SQL, and so on. 
And then you can transform that in various ways. You can validate, clean, sort, filter, replace. The circle command here is the one that this particular presentation is dealing with uh, query. There's network analysis commands and also machine learning, for example, to uh, learn embeddings or you know, generate lexicalizations for nodes. And then finally, you can export them you know, into other formats. Uh, below is the URI for our GitHub. And here are just uh, a couple of examples of-, of uh, Hans, Yes. There is a raised hand from Pierre, I think. Yes, there is a question from Pierre. Um, yes. Uh, can you read it? The... I can't see my chat right now. Uh, okay, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear uh -huh. you. Okay, great. Uh, you know, uh, out of curiosity, you presented the data model, compared it to property graphs, not yet star and so on. Um, is it is it possible in KGTK uh, to have multiple identical edges uh, that is same same subject predicate and object um, and and to have multiple occurrences of the same edge basically with uh, different properties on them? Uh, yes, but then these edges would have different IDs. Of course, okay, but that's that's supported by the model. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, so back to my uh, command examples here. So you don't have to go into the details of these invocations just to give you a flavor of what these look like. These are all basically, you know, shell commands, KGDK, uh, you know, one sort of inter the main interaction mode is as a shell command. So you say KGDK, then give it some sub command and then depending on the command, a number of options. So at the left here, you see uh, a command to generate text embeddings. So this you know, uses a large number of hyperparameters. So there are a lot of options here. Uh, on the right uh, top, there's a grep command to just sort of easily filter you know, edges based on uh, a pattern. And you know, at the bottom here, which is sort of what we will be focusing on, is a query command that in this case counts all properties uh, of politicians in a, in a Wikidata data set. And as Pedro also pointed out, we can then chain these commands into pipelines. For example, here is a little summary of a pipeline. So you start with input Wikidata and the options here are um, you know, just uh, abbreviated since there's many, of course. And then we use the slash as our pipe operator. So you can then filter this through another, uh, pipe this through another command that filters, you know, all P463 edges. And I forgot what P463 stands for in Wikidata. Uh, but then you can clean the data, curate it, ignore certain columns again with another command. And at the end, you can generate some graph statistics, for example, and compute page rank. So this is a, you know, one pipeline that does a very complex workflow, but it's sort of fairly concise and basically sort of chains, you know, TSV for, for each of these slashes, there's TSV data flowing from left to right. So Kaifer, uh, Kaifer is a query language for uh, our system. And so why Kaifer? Uh, and so when we started out, you know, many of the use cases that we dealt with needed knowledge graph assembly from a variety of different sources. And as I, you know, pointed out before, we have already a large number of these extract, transform, load commands. But, you know, designing a proper workflow can be challenging. There are many commands available and there are many options to master and navigate. So query languages, you know, from different systems, uh, such as you know, SQL or RDF or you know, Neo4j provide this nice flexibility of a mix of pattern matching and computation, uh, declarative computation that address many different use cases. And we also had anecdotal evidence you know, from teaching classes that Cypher, which is the query language of Neo4j, was fairly easy to use by non-experts, uh, also known as students. And so for that reason, KGDK, which basically stands for Cypher, uh, over, uh, you know, over KGDK, uh, and we then renamed it to Kypher since it is not exactly Cypher and uh, the Cypher uh, language and, and model is, is licensed. So we actually had to come up with a different name. So therefore Kypher was born. Uh, and so in a nutshell here, Kypher queries translate into SQL over KGDK uh, TSV data tables. So again, you get, you know, 
TSB files in, result files out, you can pipe them to and from other KGDK commands. So you can easily have an import command directly pipe it to a query, for example, or you know, from a query pipe to other KGDK commands. Underneath, this is executed via a SQLite, you know, which is embedded in Python, which is a very lightweight, lightweight database uh, system. There's all you know automatic behind the scenes data import indexing and caching. You do not need to know anything about the database. There's no server or accounts to set up. The data is cached in the graph cache, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. So it's very efficiently uh, reusable. It has very good scalability. Uh, Pedro already pointed to that. So we tested this successfully on Wikidata scale graphs with one and a half billion edges and the import and indexing of the size takes maybe about two hours on my laptop. While, you know, otherwise you might, you know, if you do this in blaze graph, it might, you know, you might grow a beard, you know, uh, over the time it takes to import the data. And this creates a data bits file of about 200 gigabytes. So it's not small, but it's still significantly smaller, for example, than what RDF would create. And the queries run in milliseconds to minutes, depending on the result sizes. So this is a very uh, practical way of dealing, you know, of interacting with relatively low level compute resources you know, on large scale data. So here's one example uh, of, again, our example graph and how that, how that might map to um, uh, a query. So here, we want to, you know, we have, it starts with a declaration of where the input is coming from. So there's a dash I uh, option that points to a TSV file. So this is, you know, this is what we're querying over in this case, and there could be multiple, but in the example, we only have one. Then there's a match option, which basically, you know, is a pattern that selects some edges, you know, from this data. So we have a movie that goes via a label edge to a name, and there's a cast edge which, you know, we, in this particular case, we're interested in uh, Linda Hamilton. And we also want to know about an award this uh, movie has won. And then, uh, you know, here we actually ask about, you know, so here are, are in these, these pink, you know, um, lines here uh, show the correspondence here. So this is the movie node that gets matched to these, this movie variable. Uh, and there's this cast edge here that get, gets matched to uh, this particular relation variable. And, and further on, we can also match the uh, edge IDs, you know, as we do here with their winner edge, you know, to the IDs of, uh, of these particular edges. So that's what we're interested in. Uh, we then have further restrictions. For example, we only want to have uh, movies where the name is available with an English, you know, uh, language suffix, and then we can specify what of this query we want to return. So there's a return specification, and I will tell you a little bit more about that in the hands-on tutorial. Uh, and so again, input TSV file, output TSV file. Um, so finally, just a quick summary of what we think sort of sort of main benefits of, of Kaifer. It's a simple ASCII art edge matching uh, pattern language inspired by Neo4j's Cypher. There's no complex join syntax as in SQL, which you know makes it difficult for people to use. It's simple to go from an edge to a qualifier edge to maybe another qualifier. You know, there's no reification uh, required. You can uh, query over multiple named, you know, or, or unnamed input graphs via files. Uh, it gives you an efficient way of partitioning and indexing the data. Uh, you can sort of efficiently join, you know, uh, with your, your input data instead of possibly having to run thousands of Sparkle queries. If you have to run against a Sparkle endpoint and you want information for a large number of different constants, that's maybe too large to just have a simple values clause. It enables you to basically have an easy personal Wikidata endpoint. And most importantly, it's simple. There's no servers, accounts, users to set up or know about, and it seamlessly integrates into the KGDK tool chain. So again, this is the, the general uh, tutorial uh, description URI in the chat is uh, another URI that I will tell you in a, in a minute. So here are just the mechanics to get you started on the tutorial. So on the tutorial webpage, 
there is a resources section that points, you know, to this particular uh, uh, URI that's in the chat, which is the one to get to the Colab notebooks. So once you are on that, and I will walk you through that in a second, you click on the, the first notebook, you know, KGDK introduction, and then follow my instructions here or the directions there. The most important thing is when you go on, when you uh, dial up this notebook, you have to make a copy to your own Google Drive. You know, otherwise you can't modify that notebook. That particular notebook is shared and you only have read access to it. In order to actually run the demo, you have to make a copy to your Google Drive. It's easy, I'll show you that. And then you can run it uh, yourself. Or, you know, uh, alternatively, you could install KJDK on your own, but this might be difficult to do in the time uh, of the tutorial. So here, just uh, a couple of notes. Obviously, you can you know, use the chat or just raise your hand or speak up in Zoom. Or if your collab doesn't work for whatever reason, just watch it and we'll try to get you going during the break. All right, and let me get out of here. And so again, you know, so this is the tutorial. Um, can you see that? I hope. Uh, the agenda from here, you go to our tutorial web page, which has a resources section. And there again is the section about Colab Notebook. So this is the oh, important Hans, page. Yes. Can you slow down one second and see, you know, if people got to those pages and uh, they want to do it, uh, give them time to actually do it? Yeah, so I can do that. So this is the important page to get to. This is where the start of uh, URLs are. So I'll give you uh, maybe a minute or two. And if anybody has any problems getting to that, please let me know. So again, you know, once you're here, you simply click uh, on one of the links. There's also further instructions uh, down on this page in case you're, uh, I was going too fast. So, can, uh, Hamandip, can you repost the URL on the chat? I think we had uh, maybe a couple people join after uh, you posted and they wouldn't see it. Okay. Okay. If anybody has questions, you can unmute yourselves and yeah, ask your questions. All right. So, I'll, I'll continue uh, since we're already sort of using a lot of time here. So I'm, you know, clicking on this first link here, KJDK introduction, IPython notebook, and I've already clicked on that before. And this basically gets me to this shared version of the notebook on Google Colab. And as I said, you, you cannot, you should not try to run this one. So once you're on that, you have to go on the file uh, menu and say, save a copy in drive. And you know, for that to work, you have to be logged in, and you have to have an account on uh, a Google you know, Drive account. So if you don't have one, don't try to run this because it won't work. Uh, so I click on that, and then now it says creating a copy. And now the copy is complete, and now I can open this in a new tab, which is what I'm doing. Uh, and you see now it has actually opened a copy of this particular notebook, not the actual initial one that provided the source for everything. So now the first thing I'll be doing, I'll be clearing all the outputs here. I go on the edit menu and clear all the outputs so we can actually see what's happening. And so you have to, and this will be the same for all other notebooks as well. So for each notebook in the sessions following this one that you run, you again have to go through these steps because they're all running, running in separate, you know, collab runtimes. So we first have to actually install KHDK, and this will take about a minute to run. So you click on the little run icon uh, in on the left-hand side, and it will then spin the circle for a while until it is done. So this is the one, at least for this one, that takes the longest. And But after about a minute or so, it should be done. It so, you know, downloads everything and installs it in this local uh, environment. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so so KGTK is actually easy to install. It doesn't take that long. You just All right, so now it is done. And then there's one more important thing to do. At the end of this output, uh, it now brought up this button. Uh, we said in order to you know, deal with this warning that it printed, you have to restart the runtime. So click on that, uh, on that button and confirm. And at this point, we should be good to go. So you know, to get started, there's you know all these notebooks have a little bit of setup that you have to click through. So we go through these cells. You know, there's a couple of import statements, uh, there are a couple of parameters to set, and some files to set up. Uh, this last one also downloads a little bit of data, so it takes just a couple of seconds, but should be done now and at this point uh, we can check this is just to sort of make sure everything is set up and it looks like it uh, and at this point we are set up to actually run through the tutorial so this took uh, a few minutes but now I can actually tell you a little bit about you know the query command you know looking at the time I won't really get through a whole lot in this tutorial but once you've set that up for yourself you can step through the rest you know it's documented and it's fairly self explanatory. I will just get you going a little bit on the uh, initial parts of it so query as all the other things in kgdk is a command uh, and so if you type kgdk query dash h you would get the output here which basically sort of groups you know uh, this into a set of options there's a couple of input options that allow you to you know, you know specify what to do where the input is coming from and uh, a few other things then a main uh, set of options has to do with the query itself, such as you know the match pattern, where clauses, optional clauses, and so on. And finally, there's output options that tell you what to do with the result of the query, tell the system what to do with the result. And then there's a number of things that control the over, overall execution. You know, there's various things such as indexing is automatic, but you can also control that uh, to a certain extent. You can have an explanation for queries and so on. So let's start with something really, really simple, which is basically selecting edges with the query match clause. Uh, overall, KGDK takes a full, it'll be a full type for query, you know, where all the statements are basically in a simple, in a single string, or you can supply individual clauses, which is kind of the preferred way, because it's somewhat easier to do in a, a Unix or Linux you know, shell environment. So here we have a simple graph on a simple query on a single input graph with an anonymous edge pattern. And so we use uh, a shell variable here uh, as the input and just show you what's, you know, this is basically just the name of a file uh, that's been uploaded to this environment. And we can now run this query, uh, which basically says, you know, use this graph as input and find all edges that match this. And this is a completely anonymous edge pattern with the from edge and the relation and the two edge, two nodes, sorry, uh, all unspecified. So it will basically match every edge in this file. And then so basically what you see here is the, is the content of this little uh, example file. Uh, the file name is here that we usually just use the small graph variable to refer to. Now, also in, in my demo, which is a little bit different from the ones uh, at you know, following, I like to sort of be as close to the bare metal as possible. There is not, you know, uh, so you can sort of see what the system is doing. So this is basically running a shell command and this is the output that it prints and there's tabs separated. So these tabs align a little bit differently in some of the following uh, uh, sessions, you will have a more pretty printed version of that. But I just wanted to really sort of see that this is, this is what it is. It's like a cat command or a Unix sort command. And this is the output that the system prints you know, to your terminal. Um, Okay, let me just go on here. So there's a couple of other ways, you know, so if you just have, uh, you just specify the from node, then the rest of the pattern is sort of filled in by default. 
actually this completely anonymous edge is kind of the default match pattern that's used. So this is another way of basically generating the same output. And it is equivalent to the kjdk cat command. So if you ran kjdk cat, again, with the same input on this graph, you would get the same result. So all these you know, uh, commands that I showed here are basically equivalent. One sort of important thing to use often, particularly once you start working with larger data sets and when you're debugging your queries, is to use the limit option to limit the amount of results that you're getting, particularly if you're running, say, a query over all of Wikidata and you've made a mistake, you might, you know, without that, you might suddenly have 1.5 billion edges be printed to your terminal. So you don't want that. So here we basically, again, use uh, the same query as before, but now we give it a limit option and we only get you know the first three edges, for example. There's also skip, which I will skip for time reasons, or you could basically use the kgdk uh, head command. So this is a simple example of a kgdk pipeline. So we start with a query and then we are pumping this to kgdk head and we're telling it, which is very similar to the Unix head command, with the difference that it knows about you know, header columns. So the next thing we can restrict uh, edges, we can make them more specific, for example, by you know, binding a node to a specific constant. So this is the uh, syntax that's used for that uh, in, in KJDK Kypher, which is you know, the same as Cypher is using for Neo4j. So we basically have this colon followed by a constant. Uh, the one difference here is that in Cypher, this actually means a type restriction. Well, for us, this actually is interpreted as the ID of a node. So there's a little bit of a different semantics here. Um, but now when we run this query, we only get edges that start with uh, Maria Shriver. Uh, so you know, she is a spouse and she also has a name. Uh, similarly, you can do the same thing for uh, the relation part or for the relation part of an edge. So here we are only interested in name edges. So we get you know Lisa Hamilton, you know uh, Linda Hamilton, and so on. All these uh, person entities, person nodes in the data and their names. So if, for this case, the semantics between Kypher and Cipher is very much the same. Uh, and of course, you can combine them. So you can uh, say, look for Arnold Schwarzenegger's name by binding both the from node and the to node, or you could just use, you could start from the to node, you know, anything uh, is possible here. Now, for something slightly more complex, you know, and interesting, there's many things one can do uh, in the where clause. So you can start with, you know, selecting edges, and then only return those where the you know, com uh, complex Boolean expression that you know you can specify in the weird clause uh, is true. And only edges for which this evaluates true will be returned. And this allows you to you know express all kinds of conditions that aren't expressible directly in the pattern. So the, for example, here. We are using a pattern, you know, just for explanatory purposes, where we say, well, we look for nodes P that have a name edge to something else. And then we say P equals uh, Maria Schreiber, which is basically the same query we had before, where we specified the restriction directly in the pattern. And, you know, it gives us the same uh, result. And, you know, of course, we could say it twice. We could say it in the pattern and in the where restriction, which is also fine. It's just redundant. Um, here's something a little bit more interesting. We can use, for example, a regular expression to filter the names attached to nodes. Uh, so here is this uh, equals uh, tilde operator for regular expression matching. So we, again, we select name edges, and then we're looking for names that match this particular regular expression. Uh, one thing I should mention that I forgot before that these constants within the where expression, they have to be quoted you know, here with double quotes. And if you run this in the Unix shell, this is a little tricky because these quotes interact with the shell quoting mechanism. 
So uh, you have to make sure that so we are using actually two different types of quotes, single quotes on the outside here and double quotes on the inside. And there's different ways of doing this also in the in KJDK in the uh, Kaifer API that make that a little bit simpler. Anyway, this uh, regular expression looks a little complicated here. It basically is a Python syntax, uh, Python regular expression, and it looks for double occurrences of some letter. So it, uh, it gets all names that have some double letter in it. And in this data, the only one is Arnold Schwarzenegger with the double G. So um, I'm sorry, yes. there's a question in the chat. Okay, can you read it to me? I can't really see the chat. Okay. Uh, do you have any suggestions on using KGTK on a data set that is not from Wikidata? Any data cleaning or data format aside from it being TSV that should be taken into account? Um, no, do we? Uh, I mean, we work a lot with Wikidata, but we work also with various you know, other data sets. So as long as you can describe the data in this format, which you know should be easier than if you, for example, had to map it onto RDF, since we are more flexible in our literal syntax as well as in our data model. As long as you can do that, as long as you can describe it in a TSV file, um, you should be able to work with it. So it's sort of hard to know without actually knowing which data you are asking about, but. Wikidata is fairly complex, so it's sort of hard to find something that's, you know, more complex than that. Yeah, I mean, we, we have an example in the tutorial of uh, importing an IMDB file from Kaggle and incorporating it into the knowledge graph. Okay. So I'll have to speed up here since I'm sort of getting to the end of my time, which I sort of expected. So I will go through this query and then maybe show one more aggregation query and then just wind this up. And you will see a lot more queries throughout this tutorial. So here we are filtering. Uh, so I just showed you this regular expression example. Another one is using this in clause where we're saying, well, we are looking for name edges where the starting node is one of these. Uh, and so this is also a common expression you know, in SQL, for example, uh, the difference here to Cypher is that Cypher is a little bit more powerful. So instead of just listing uh, constants, you can also have arbitrary evaluable expressions. So our syntax and our semantics here is a little bit more restrictive. Nevertheless, you know, this is a very useful thing to use. So now I get all edges that have these two, you know, one of these two as their starting node. And I just want to go to the aggregation section since this, you know, um, there's a lot of stuff in here and this is a, a somewhat shorter tutorial and the last time we taught this. So I have, don't really have time to go through all this. But one thing I want to show you, you know, and, and count is sort of the, the similar one is similar to SQL and Cypher, we can uh, we support various aggregation functions such as, you know, counting edges, finding a minimum, maximum average and so on. And the simplest and really the most frequently used operation that we use to analyze data sets and do various things is counting. So for example, here we have a query, where we count how many edges have terminated to judgment day as their starting node. Uh, and you know, I had to skip over the section that explained the return clause. So we already showed the match clause. Then you have the return clause, which is kind of like the set of return columns in a select statement of Sparkle or SQL. So here you can say, which are the things that I want to actually output and you can name them. Uh, and so I'll just talk over this for a second here. But this match clause basically selects all edges that have terminated to judgment day as their starting node. And then we have this aggregation function uh, as the first uh, return value, which basically, you know, just counts them all up uh, and then reports this in a column named n. And the difference to uh, a language such as SQL or Sparkle is that in, in Kypher, in, inspired by Cypher, there is no, there are no group by constants. You're not really uh, telling by which columns you're grouping by for this aggregation. It's basically all prior columns. 
Uh, and in this case, there's no prior columns. So it's basically just aggregating the one result column that I'm specifying here. And, um, you know, this is nice because it's more simple. You don't have sort of less syntax to worry about. It makes some things a little bit more difficult. You know, you want sometimes have to reorder the, the uh, clauses in a way to uh, support your aggregation. But again, you will see various examples throughout. And please, if you have any questions, either you know, send us uh, email or uh, Slack messages or look at the documentation. There's lots and lots of documentation about all this. Um, and I'll just go to the very end. And there are some links here at the end you know, for further reading uh, about the various things in this notebook. So once, if you step through this, you'll, you'll get to these links and you can find other information. And I'll stop sharing here. And if anybody has a quick question, yeah, there is a question. Uh, so a question from Pierre Antoine. So my understanding was that KGTK subcommands were returning sets of knowledge graphs, but the result of a query is not a KG, is it? Um, the result of a query is generally a KG. That the sort of, the result of a query can be, however, any uh, TSV. Uh, file or TSV output. So it's not, it, you have full control in the return statement of what the output looks like. So if the output, for example, is only a single column, that's not a KGDK, uh, uh, a valid KGDK uh, file format that you could then ingest by something else. Uh, so if you want a KGDK valid file, you have to specify the node one label node two and ID edges uh, in your output. Um, each query only generates a single output. So you would have to run multiple in order to get you know, multiple knowledge graphs and then combine them further. Yeah, we'll have lots of examples of that in the other tutorials where the KGTK commands generate TSV files that themselves are KGTK files uh, that then you know you can further query or do anything KGTK with them. Okay, so so at this point uh, we are our plan was to split into breakout rooms and uh, we have very few people, so uh, we can ask you what you prefer. Uh, so we're, you know, the options are to either do the tutorial or profiling and browsing knowledge graphs, which that which shows you know how can you use KGTK to uh, so compute various interesting profile statistics from any knowledge graph. We're doing it on this subset of Wikidata that we have for the tutorial. Uh, and the other option is how to uh, extend a knowledge graph with external CSV files uh, or TSV files. Uh, and the example is how to incorporate information from IMDB uh, into Wikidata. And so uh, I think we can, uh, we could do a vote and uh, or we could actually split out into the breakout rooms and do both in parallel. Uh, so we could say, you know, who wants to do profiling, who wants to do IMDB, and then we proceed accordingly. So you have to ask the question so that can people can respond to the specific question. So we have one vote for profiling, profiling. Oh, in the chat, okay. Okay, so uh, you know maybe and no preference for me. So uh, let's do the profiling one, and then people can do the IMDb one offline. Uh, you know, it's the the tutorial has lots of uh, you know comments, and uh, you can sort of uh, 
run it on Google Colab and do it yourself. Is that also in the link that was sent earlier? Yes. Okay. It's in the GitHub link has all the uh, all the options. Maybe you know, post the GitHub link again. I don't know, you know when people join again or join, they, they use the chat. Okay, so I'm on deep you're up. Okay. Um, let me share the screen. Okay, um, so this is our GitHub uh, with all the links. I'm going through the 02 KG profiling notebook here. And I have already clicked on it. And Hans, as Hans explained, we need to make a copy. So I already did that while Hans was presenting. And I did a few more things while Hans was presenting. I set up uh, the notebook, I installed KGTK, I um, imported all the files which I needed. And I also uh, loaded those files into the cache, which is used by KGTK query. Uh, and so I'm gonna start with the, with the part uh, which computes the global KG statistics. And uh, I've just gone ahead and done that in advance. So if you have any questions or if you want to follow along, let me know. I will go a bit slower or wait for you. So in this notebook, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we will count the number of instances, uh, classes and properties. And then we will count the number of instances of each class. And then we will count include the count of instances of the subclasses of a class as well. And then we will generalize the Wikidata instance of, which is a P31, uh, to include occupation and position help so that our profiles include statistics about classes such as director and so on. So this will, I'll explain that as we go, go along in the notebook. <clears throat> All right, so I will start from compute the global KG statistics cell this is basically counting all the edges in the graph so this you can do in, in using a unix command so that's what we have done here this is you know just counting all the uh, lines in our all files so all file is a combination of all the edges in our knowledge graph normally we have we will split it up into sub files like labels aliases descriptions and claims in a different file so that we have more flex flexibility to work with them. Um, and then the next cell is, uh, we will count the number, total number of nodes. Uh, this can be a bit tricky because nodes can appear in position node one or in position node two. So if you remember from the data model, we have node one label node two. Uh, Amani, then, yeah. Can you make your font a little bit bigger? It might be difficult for some people to see. There you go, okay. thank you. Okay, so um, from the data model, we have node one, label node two, and then uh, the nodes can appear in node one or node two column. So that's what we're doing here. This is using Typher. Uh, so this is a, a slightly easy to read uh, syntax. I'm not using command line, but I'm using the function called KGTK, which, which is available as an API. And we use this to run the KGTK uh, commands, uh, it makes uh, writing the notebook and reading it a bit more uh, easier. So in the first query, I'm matching node one to, uh, we have this node one ID node two, and I'm just returning distinct node ones. Uh, and in the second query, I am matching node one ID node two, but returning distinct node two, uh, and then outputting them into two different files. And in the third, command, I am just concatenating them together. Uh, and then this is what it looks like. So we are not distinguishing between uh, literals or entities. So that's why you see all these literals in the beginning. Um, so basically it's telling us we have about 1.4 million uh, nodes in our knowledge graph. So this is the same knowledge graph which Hans um, 
presented in the beginning. So this is an Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, subgraph of Wikidata. Uh, we took the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger Q node and then built a, a knowledge graph around that, including its uh, siblings, uh, its co-actors, and then using a command called reachable nodes to further enrich it. And then the second, uh, now uh, in the next cell, what we're going to do is we will count the number of instances in our knowledge graph. So which is easy because we use P31. P31 is instance of property in Wikidata. And this is simply if we match instance and we find all the P31 edges and then we have the class. Uh, and then we return the distinct instance as count instance. So this will tell you how many instances of all the classes are there in, in our knowledge graph. You can see there are about 58,000 instances. The next query is count the number of properties. And this is also straightforward. We have an instance, uh, this particular syntax, uh, L matches to the ID of the edge, and then the property gives you the actual property. Uh, and then we simply return the distinct properties. Uh, count of distinct properties. And we have about 3,874 properties in our knowledge graph. Uh, to give an idea, in the total Wikidata, uh, we have about 10,000 properties. And since this is a subgraph, so this is the number of properties we managed to uh, extract. Excel is uh, counting the number of classes. Now, this is a bit more uh, challenging because uh, version of classes is kind of ex implicit. Uh, so what we define as class is whichever uh, node has a P279 edge. P279 edge is basically subclass of in Wikidata. Uh, and what we are going to do here, we are going to use uh, artifact of KGTK, which is what we call P279 star. So P279 star is a file which we compute, um, which includes the transitive uh, closure of all the classes. So we introduce a new edge called P279 star, and we go from one class to all of its uh, superclasses. So that file uh, is pre-computed, and we're going to use that to count the number of uh, classes. So this query is using P279 star. Uh, what we do is we match the node one using p279 star edge uh, and we call it superclass and simply return all the superclasses and we have about 14598 uh, classes in our arnold arnold uh, subgraph um okay so moving along uh, we have a week and the next query is to count the number of qualifier edges. And this is using another Kaifer query. So what we're doing is we are matching N1, ID, N2. So this ID then maps to the edge ID. And then we take that ID and then we've, we've mapped it to the qualifier ID and then the qualifier value. So what this query is doing is uh, getting all the edges and then from that edge, uh, getting all the uh, the qualifiers of that uh, of any if present there, and then what we do is return count distinct qualifier IDs. So if I run this query, uh, give it a second to finish. We have about uh, forty five four hundred four fifty thousand uh, qualifiers. Okay, moving along. So now we can enhance the query to show us the distribution of properties used as qualifiers. And then we capture that in another variable called qualifier property. So what's happening here is, so we find all the edges by N1, ID, N2, and then we find all the qualifiers by mapping the ID as node one. And then we get the qualifier ID, and then this qualifier property will give you the properties being used as qualifiers, and then it's simply map mapping to the values. But what we're returning is the qualifier property and then the count, uh, which, which will be the label. And then we count distinct qualifier ID. So we're returning the qualifier property and then counting 
the qualifier IDs. And then we order by node two uh, to see uh, which is the most prevalent property. So Use while this key. query runs, so uh, Antoine, I think this is an example where you know the output file is you know another knowledge graph. It has no label, node one label and node two. So this is really a proper knowledge graph file, and then it's being piped into the add labels command, which then goes and finds the labels for the you know the, the nodes that appear in either node one label or node two. Uh, so this is an example of how easy it is to kind of create a new knowledge graph as an output of a query and then use it in your the rest of your your pipeline. All right, shall I continue? Yep. Okay. So this is the result of that uh, query. So it tells you P one five four five, which is series ordinal is the most prevalent qualified property in our subgraph, and then followed by point in time and start time and so on. And then it also gives you a number of times it has been used. Um, okay, so um, in the next section, we will we'll get the instance counts for each of the class. So this is a very basic uh, profiling query where we count the number of direct instances of each class. Um, and then the way we do this is we, this is again a Kaifer query. Uh, we have this edge uh, with, with this pattern uh, instance P31 class. P31 again is instance of. So we find all the P31 edges in our knowledge graph. And then we return the class. And then distinct instances as count. So uh, let me run this query while I explain. And then we order by the number of uh, number of instances. So as expected, uh, we have Q5, which is the class human, as the most prevalent class in our knowledge graph because it is uh, revolving around the argument of who is a human in the Wikidata. Um, and I mean, he's a human normally too, but you know, he is described as human in Wikidata as well. And then the second one is bilateral relation, film, river, universities. Uh, so the, this is all expected uh, because you know, this is uh, revolves around an actor and his filmography. All right. So in the next query, we, sim we are simply running the same uh, query, but we, instead of printing it to the command line, what we are going to do is put that in a file so that we can use it down the line. So again, uh, same query, find all the P31 edges, uh, find uh, return the counts. And then this is chaining a bunch of commands in there. So it, it adds another command, command called add ID. And then the ID cell Wikidata, there are a bunch of different ID styles. Uh, and then output to the metadata.p31.count. So the result of previous queries are now in a file. And Let's take a look at our output directory. So we see that we have created this file uh, as an output of the previous set. Okay, so uh, what in the next step, what we're going to do is we will in, uh, load this into the uh, database cache for the KGT query. Uh, but you can do this by uh, assigning it a minus i, uh, so the query minus i, the file path, and as P31 count. So this as is an alias. So you can th think of different files as tables. So when you load it into the database cache file, uh, by default, it will have the same name as the file name, uh, but you can do it an alias for, for your convenience. So that's what we're gonna do here. And you can see, uh, you know, we have Q5, and then I think this was relativity or what was this? Bilateral relation. All right. Moving on. So the summary of the section: What we did, uh, we computed the count of instances for every class, and then we illustrated the use of instance of two queries, and we also illustrated common conventions to add identifiers and how to save results to files. We also introduced you to another artifact of KGTK, which is P two seventy nine star. All right. Now. 
let's make it a bit more complex. Uh, we will now compute P31 count transitive. This is basically a count a number of instances of a class that include the instances of all the subclasses. So the approach is like this. So we find the class of each instance, and then we find all the superclasses uh, of those classes for each instance. And then for every superclass, we count the number of instances. Um, because this is a complex query, it kind of touches the whole Wikidata, uh, which has millions of classes. Like since we're working with a subclass, it should be faster to run. So what we do here is, again, uh, using Kuiper, uh, we use the all file. Uh, we find all the P31 edges, uh, which is instance of, and then for all this, uh, for each class, we find the superclass using the P279 star edge. And then what we return is a uh, superclass, and then we count the distinct instances. So we started from instance and find an, uh, find our way to superclass, and we return superclass and the in distinct instances as count. And then we order by the instance counts. And before I run this query, do you want to guess which class we are going to find at the top? You can write it in the chat. Yeah, you can try to guess in the chat. I will, <laughs> I will run this and let's see if you guessed it correctly. So this is a really complex query and uh, you know so it takes uh, you know a few seconds here but this is the kind of query that you know when i was trying on sparkle it would never finish okay. all right so this has finished and uh, it is it was kind of expected that the entity would have the most class count so entity is basically the the topmost class and each of the class in data is a subclass of it. Uh, and then we have collection entities and then we have sets and groups and so on. So this is uh, this is the result of that query. Um, and uh, we're going to do the same query, but we will save this in a file so that we can use and just run it. <clears throat> okay, so while that is running, I'm going to set up uh, the next couple of cells. So what we want to do is we want to find the number of uh, Q5, which is human, and then artist, which is that Q node, and then the film director, which is that Q node. Any instance of human, but only one instance of artist and none of film director. So this query is, we are using another KGTK command, which is like a grep, and we use our metadata P31 count file uh, computed in the previous cell. And then we want to find Q5, uh, the artist Q node, the film director Q node, and we just want to add levels. So it tells you there are 13,000, almost 14,000 humans, only one artist, and no film directors, which is kind of counterintuitive because this is a subgraph uh, focusing on actors, directors, and so on. But then the reason is uh, Wikidata uses the property occupation, which is P106 to relate people to their occupation. So the actors, uh, so Arnold is not an actor uh, or is not an instance of actor, but he has an occupation actor. So that's why we cannot use P31 uh, to find this information. So what we're going to do, okay, let me summarize the section. So we computed the counts, count, of, count of instances of every class, including the subclasses. And then uh, already introduced Q7, Two cent one star. Okay, moving on. So in this section, I will do what I was just talking about. So we will use, we will generalize P31, and we will use the P106, which is occupation and position health P39, to behave as P31 statement. So the way to do that uh, is compute x P31 y, x P106 y, and x P30 nine Y statements using the new P31X predicate and make it behave like P31. So the way to do is again, uh, KGTK filter command, uh, and we want to find P39, P106, and let's see what we get here. 
So, okay, so we have node one, uh, P106, and this is Franz Zimmerman, whose occupation is university teacher, uh, and so on. So we found the occupations and the position helps. So I'm gonna skip to this query, uh, which produces uh, what we want. So as this runs, I will explain. So we find P31 edges, but we find that only for humans. So this one is node one, uh, edge name is P31, and the node two is Q5, uh, which is human. And then we want to find N1, uh, we want to capture the property of those edges, and then there's N2. Uh, and then where property is in P106, P39, and P31. Uh, so what this is doing is it, it's finding all the humans and it's finding all the edges for those humans, which, have, which are P106 or P39. And then it returns N1 uh, as the node one, P31X as the label, and N2 as node two. Uh, and you can see here, uh, we have a new property called P31X, and uh, we have the node one was Franz Zimmerman and University Teacher. So now we have, captured P1 P106, P39, and P31 as P31X, which we can do uh, use to do more interesting queries. Okay, so I'm gonna capture that in a, in a file so that we can uh, load that into cache and use an out subsequent query. So this is the same query. It adds the IDs and it uh, puts them in a derived P31X file. And then I loaded this P31X file into, into the cache as well, and I gave it as label P31X. And you can see these two are, uh, you know, if you need to talk to the OSTL. Okay. okay. So now we're going to do the same query, which we did a while ago, to find uh, instances or counts of uh, film director and artist and so on. Um, so this is the same query, you know, uh, you find the instance using p31x instead of p31 and then you you find p uh, super classes of all the classes using the p279 star so let me run this query uh, now um, okay it's completed um, all right not not take a look at humans artists and film directors again and see if we have uh, better results now or more intuitive results now so as you can see uh, we have 13,000 humans, same as before, uh, 2,500 artists and 600 film directors. So which makes a bit more intuitive sense that uh, in, in this subgraph, which is revolving around directors and actors, we have this information. Now. So this illustrates uh, how you can generalize P31 to include more properties and have uh, intuitive uh, profiling of the knowledge graph. So uh, in this next query, we will find out the classes that appear in the new file that did not appear in our old P31 count file. So the way to do that is using if not exist. This is another KGTK command. Uh, uh, what this does is it subtracts second graph from the first graph. So metadata P31X, which is our uh, new P30, uh, new count file, and then we filter on our p31 uh, dot count or transitive, which is the one using the normal p31 edge. Uh, and then we're using nodes, uh, uh, columns node one to subtract. Uh, the result of this query is give us all the classes which were not present in our, in our p31 file. And you can see all these performers, performing artists, actors, media professionals, head of government, and so on. So these were not part of our P31 count class before, but since we use the generalized version of P31X for this file, uh, we have all these classes up here. Okay, summarizing this, this section. So we computed P31X, which represents our generalized instance of property. And we put that in derived of P31.psv. Uh, and then we computed P31X count transitive as revision of P31 count transitive to include 
counts uh, by application and positional links as well. And then we store that in a file. Uh, okay. And then- Amal, you have about four minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so I will use the six minutes to go over uh, this notebook and we'll stop whenever time is up. So in the next section, we are going to compute the number of times each property appears in a class. Um, so this is computing the distribution of properties for every class in the knowledge graph. Uh, we want to know the count of different properties um, in all, all classes. So uh, as an example, we look at film, uh, we want to see what properties are used to describe films and uh, including all subclasses. So what we're going to do is uh, we use Kuiper again, uh, and then we use the all file, and we will find entity P two seventy nine class. So we find all the edges which are P two seventy nine uh, subclass of, and then we return count of the classes. So, so total number of classes P P four seven eight three, uh, sorry seven four eight three, um, and then. So here's how we're gonna find a distribution of properties. So for every entity, we compute the set of properties used to describe, and then we store this information in a, in a temporary file called item properties. And then for each of the each class, we collect all the instances below it and then count the number of times each property appears in the item properties file. So let me ex try to explain this. Um, so we are matching entities, properties, this is all the edges. And then for each of the property, uh, we want to find the data type. So this is basically, and, uh, and then we are excluding external IDs. Um, and then we want to return entity, uh, which is node one uh, in, in this query. And then P has property as a label and then property as not. So this is, this will give you uh, all the properties for every node in our knowledge graph. While that is running, I'm gonna run the second cell too. This is doing the same thing, but it's storing the result in our item properties, the PSV file, which we can use uh, down, the, down the line. All right. So if you take a look, it gives you all the, the node node ones in the node one column, and then P has property, uh, which uh, so. But this file is basically uh, we have a list of properties used to describe each each key, and uh, we store that in a file. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we will use the P279 star file to get all the superclasses of each entity and then look up uh, the entity in the item properties graph to find the property it uses. Uh, we will invent a new property called P1963 computer to store the counts. Uh, Wikidata already has a property for this type, which is P1963. Uh, where editors can manually specify the property that should be used to describe the instance of a class. But the thing is, um, it's defined for few classes and it's not really enforced. So we, we, we don't get all the properties which should be used to describe a human. Anyways, we, we, in this section, we will try to find all the properties uh, which should be used to describe a human. So, okay, so this gets a bit complex now. So we have three inputs, the all file and then the P31X, which we computed in a previous step. And then we are using the item properties, which we computed uh, just now. Uh, what we're doing is in, from the P31X, we find all the edges, uh, which is basically entity and the class. And then in, all the, in the all file, we find P279 star and which goes to a superclass. Uh, for the class, uh, which is bound to uh, this query. 
uh, and then in the item properties, we find uh, we match the entity. Uh, this L is the ID, and then the property. And, and we return the superclass as node one from our all P2 sentiment star. P1963 computed, which, are, which is our new property as the label. Uh, and then the property from item properties as node two. And then we count distinct properties as P114, P1114, which is a count in Wikipedia. Now let's run this and see what we get. So, I mean, just a, a comment here while this runs. So, I mean, this is a really complicated query. Uh, and, you know, we can run this over all of Wikidata, basically for every class, compute all this, all the instances of every subclass of that class, and then to count the, num the way the properties are used for each one. Uh, and we can do this over all of Wikidata in the query runs for a few hours, uh, but it will compute it. And so we, we actually offer a file uh, that uh, gives the statistics of, of for all of Wikidata. Basically, uh, you know which properties are used in practice for every class in Wikidata, and there's over a million classes in Wikidata. And so, you know, this takes a, a few seconds uh, to do here. So, Amandip, you're now running into the break, I think. So, yeah. maybe just show the results. Are you um, showing the browser too, the results in the browser? Yeah, I think I, I will just move to the browser now uh, and come back to this if it finishes in time. So we have a browser. Uh, this is a public browser and this uh, it's available. You can go to that URL and put that in the chat. And uh, so you can search. Uh, so this is the same node as I'm showing. So just to give you an idea of how this will work. Uh, this is the Q node for film director. And then the, we have the aliases here. Uh, we have the label here. And then we have the description here. And on the left-hand side, you see all these properties. And then in orange, you see all the, uh, all, all the values of those properties. So and if you have more than uh, a certain number of values for each property, we have tabulation here. So you can scroll through that and see all the different values. On the right-hand side, we have identifiers. Uh, these are the external identifier properties, and this basically maps Wikidata to external databases. Uh, and then we have another section called from related items. So this shows you backward links to this, uh, this keynote. So, for example, we have MP Sukumar Nair, who is an instance of film director. Uh, and then we have filmmaker, which is a, a subclass of director, and so on. Um, so, from reader items shows you incoming links, uh, and then the properties shows you outgoing links. Um, and we were talking about P1963 properties of this type. Uh, it says P1969, which is movie meter director ID. Um, we will, okay, so on the right hand side, you have a gallery. Uh, in the, we ha also have a class visualization. Um, so it tells you the green node is the node which you are looking at. So a film director. But the red nodes are the subclasses. Uh, uh, the, sorry, the red edges are the subclasses, the blue edges are superclasses, and, uh, and the orange, the nodes which are colored orange, they have, sorry, let me just move this, they have many subclasses, so you can see it has a 70,000 instance count, uh, and then the blue nodes have few subclasses, so we're there are two different types in this visualization, few subclasses and many subclasses. 
and you can see so this basically goes from your current class all the way uh, to to the end to entity and then it shows you some of its subclasses too so you can see film director is a sub uh, subclass or director is a super class of film director and then you have an artist which goes to manager in the organization and eventually you can find entity because entity is the topmost class and uh, you can also see documentary filmmaker is a subclass filmmaker is a subclass of documentary filmmaker and so on so this gives you an idea uh, you can visualize your uh, uh, the class hierarchy and find interesting information tidbits or you can also find some uh, exceptions or you, some, something you might see as a uh, error in the data, for example. You can search. Um, you may, maybe just wrap it up because it's, you know, you know, we're eating into the break. Okay. All right. So there's one last thing I want to show. There is a bunch of new features which are coming. Uh, so this is the same film director, but in mirror data. Uh, this we have not deployed yet. It shows you the extract from Wikipedia as well for that particular entity. And then we were talking about properties of this type. And in this graph, I'm showing properties of this type computed, which we were just doing in our notebook. And it tells you there are about 2,000 properties which have been used to describe the instances of uh, film director class. And you can see, scroll through all these and find uh, find uh, that information there. And uh, one more thing, so total number of instances of this class, 67,000. Total number of instances, including its subclasses, 81,000. So these are a bunch of new features which are coming to the browser, which we will deploy, deploy in coming week. Um, and that uh, about wraps it up. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's see. Uh, so we we used up eight minutes of the break. Uh, so I think what we'll do in the next one is uh, do the the embeddings because the embeddings are you know a lot of fun and it's kind of a unique feature that distinguishes KGTK from uh, many other toolkits. So uh, so. Uh, we'll be back in you know, six minutes. Uh, so what I did uh, is I actually ran the embeddings uh, while Amandeep was uh, talking because the embeddings take uh, about you know 17 minutes to compute the embeddings on this graph. You know this graph has you know, over a million edges. Uh, so then uh, you know you won't be able to sort of execute as we go along. Uh, but you can, uh, you know, do it later on your own, and uh, we'll, I'll show you how the embeddings work, which is kind of a pretty fun part. So we'll see you in uh, six minutes. So, okay, so we're going to do the embeddings part of the tutorial. Uh, so I think, you know, it won't be possible for folks to uh, sort of follow uh, online doing it on their own, but uh, you can do this notebook uh, later. Uh, so for now, I already uh, sort of invoked uh, the, the cell. So I installed KGTK. I uh, installed Gensim, uh, as we're going to use Gensim uh, to do some of the computations with the embeddings. Uh, I imported the right packages. I we're again using the Arnold Schwarzenegger graph. Uh, and so we're using this uh, specific sub-knowledge graphs from that graph. So they all file P279 and so on. We always use P279. Uh, and uh, so those get downloaded. Uh, then, uh, you know, we're gonna compute uh, 100 dimension vectors. Uh, for this graph, uh, and we tell it where to put the vectors uh, once it computes. Uh, we're going to use that uh, P31X file that uh, Amandeep computed. 
uh, and then we're gonna run the embeddings. And so I already ran them. It took 15 minutes to compute the complex embeddings on the Arnold Schwarzenegger graph, which has, I think it, we said it had like 58,000 nodes and it had uh, about a million edges. Uh, so we tell it, uh, you know, 100 dimensions. We tell it that uh, we want complex embeddings. Uh, you can also use transi dismal and rescal uh, if you want to, but uh, we get the best results uh, with uh, the complex. And so I'm gonna start here. Uh, so let me see. Uh, so we're gonna look at the vectors. And so as you would expect, you know, we have a vector for every Q node. Uh, so uh, you know, this, uh, you know, KGTK, the KGTK command always outputs uh, the results in a pandas data frame. Uh, so you can you know, use pandas commands uh, on the results, but here I'm just using that for viewing. Uh, and so, uh, so you get the graph embeddings, uh, and then what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna convert the graph embeddings to the GenSim format uh, uh, so that uh, we can load them and work with them. And so now my embeddings are in GenSim format uh, and then I'm gonna actually load them uh, so that I can do computations. Uh, so my embeddings are now loaded. Uh, so here we have a function uh, to find the most similar uh, nodes to a vector. So once we have a vector, uh, we want to find all the nodes that are the most similar uh, to those, uh, uh, to the given vector. And I'm not gonna go through the code. Uh, I mean, you can just so think of it. Okay, we have a most similar function defined uh, and then I'm also going to do, you know, define a function to do the link prediction. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so let me do that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a function that, uh, you know, given uh, a node as the head and a relation, it finds me the tail. Uh, and this is again using the this all functions that come from uh, the complex embeddings. Uh, so let's give this a try. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, Tom Cruise and try to see, you know, predict, you know, what awards Tom Cruise received. Uh, and so that uh, gets the embeddings uh, and, uh, and I get uh, four results uh, and so, you know, for some reason, Tom Cruise is also coming, which you know, it's not a feature, and we get awards. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it turns out these are not actually the awards that Tom Cruise uh, won, uh, but you know, they, they, it shows you the embeddings are, you know, kind of working uh, in the sense that you know we get awards rather than anything else, uh, you know, but. The graph is so small that uh, you know it's kind of difficult to get really accurate uh, results from complex. Uh, let's try this uh, for cast members of uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Uh, and so we get actors. Uh, and you know, Linda Hamilton uh, appears here. Uh, so uh, we see that the embeddings uh, are kind of, you know, capturing the right structure of the of the graph. And uh, what we see from the results is that the embeddings uh, are not, you know, very good at making the right prediction. Uh, so the cast member of all fi uh, fiction includes actors. So, and this we have seen uh, in many of the experiments that uh, link prediction over Wikidata is really, really difficult. Uh, but, you know, the embeddings can be used on aggregate to sort of uh, do similarity and so on. And for that, 
they work uh, fairly well. Uh, so let's uh, find the most similar people to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so uh, what we get is all the other Schwarzeneggers uh, that are in the graph uh, for the most part. And so, you know, it, it's able in the embedding space to sort of capture these kind of structural relationships that uh, occur in the graph, which is, uh, you know, fairly nice. Uh, and so we have rivers in our graph. So let's find uh, the most similar entities to this particular river, which I don't know where it is, uh, uh, but it has a German sounding name. Uh, and then when I get uh, the rivers that are most similar to this one, I get rivers in Germany, uh, which seems reasonable. So. Uh, so this means that the embeddings are kind of working reasonably well. Uh, so one, one of the cool things that you can do is uh, use the Google projector, uh, which is you know, a library from Google that lets you actually see the embeddings in a visualization. Uh, and so what we're gonna do uh, is filter our knowledge graph to contain only four types of, uh, four classes of nodes, you know, films, actors, rivers, and politicians. Uh, and so to filter out the graph, you know, we're just gonna do a query. Uh, so like many of our queries, uh, you know, they always go the same way. Uh, uh, so we have several input graphs that uh, we, uh, you know, use. And so this is one of the nice features of uh, KQTK that it's not just one graph. And, uh, you know, we have basically, uh, you know, the, the vectors that we computed is, an, is a graph that we're using. Uh, and then this derived P31X is another graph that we're using. So this shows you how you can kind of compose the products of your workflow and so build on them. Uh, and so, you know, I, you know, I can't really do this on a public endpoint because I cannot load my so personal files like these vectors into somebody else's uh, server. So I would always have to install my own, uh, but with KGTK, you don't have to do that. And so, you know, we're gonna so find all the items that are uh, of a particular class, which is any of these uh, classes. Uh, and then, you know, we always use P279 star, so to get everything below. Uh, and, uh, and so we're gonna just, you know, return what we want, which is, you know, the node, uh, you know, the, the, the relation, the embedding, uh, and then we're gonna get the, the node label. Uh, so here we use this uh, you know, function from KGTK to get the string uh, of a so language qualified string. And then uh, for every instance, we're gonna group concat all the types, all the classes. So if uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is an actor and a politician, then we're going to concatenate all those classes into a type uh, and the same for the you know, type label. And so we'll run this and it'll create a file for us uh, that is going to uh, be useful for Google Projector. And so let's uh, take a look at what we got. Uh, so here we have a Q node. We have the embedding, uh, and then we have the label of the node, uh, the type as a Q node, and then the, the label of the Q node. Uh, and so this file basically contains everything that I'm gonna want to load into my Google projector. Uh, and I have to, so first uh, convert, uh, you know, 
to the format that the Google projector wants. Uh, and uh, so we actually use this uh, so often uh, that you know we wrote a command to kind of com convert the embedding format to what the Google projector wants. And so let's took a, take a look at what that looks like. Uh, so uh, the node one, uh, so this is of our metadata file. So it has the Q node. And then in the visualization where we want to be able to see what's the label of the Q node and what is the class of that Q node. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we can take a look at the actual vectors. Uh, Google projector wants a file that has no header. Uh, and so this is why it's showing like this in Panda. So it has to be in the same order as the metadata file. So the first vector has to correspond to the first you know, line in the metadata file. Uh, so I'm going to uh, you know, download this into my computer. Uh, so I'll download the file. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big file. Uh, and then you know, it appeared here. I'm going to da download the metadata. And I'm going to go to the Google projector. And so here I am in Google projector. Uh, this is of what it shows you, you know, uh, as of sample file, but I'm gonna load the files that we just created. Uh, so I need my vectors, uh, which are this ones. Uh, and I need my metadata file, uh, which is this one. And I'm going to go here. And it's already computed PCA for them. Uh, so I'm going to color the nodes by my uh, the stuff that I put in my metadata file. Uh, so I'm going to color the nodes by type. Uh, and I'm going to label the nodes first by type so that we can see what is what. So if I go here. Uh, you know, the red ones are films. Uh, these so bluish ones are actors. Uh, let me, uh, these ones are politicians. Uh, and, you know, these ones are rivers. And we're seeing that, uh, you know, even in PCA, you know, the separation of the vectors is, is pretty good. Uh, so this tells you that the vectors are reasonable even though they're not accurate enough for link prediction. So let me actually compute the, a different visualization of the vectors, uh, which you know, is, you know, I think, uh, you know, much better. So it does a much better uh, you know, reduction of dimensions from 100 to 3. Uh, and so we're seeing the 100 vectors in three dimensions. And so here they are. Uh, and so, you know, we see, you know, films that it made two clusters of films. It actually made several clusters of rivers. It put all the politicians here, uh, all the actors here. Uh, and so I can switch my metadata uh, to actually label them with the actual you know, labels of the entities, not of the classes. So I see here, you know, who, who is in here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, you know, the clusters are fairly clean. I mean, I see a few, uh, a few kind of errant dots. Uh, so I see Arnold Schwarzenegger is here uh, with, you know, I forgot, so which one? Uh, so type the, so these ones are actor, you know, Ar you know Arnold Schwarzenegger has a label actor and politician, uh, but you know, the, the embedding actually thinks that Arnold is really much more of an actor 
than a politician. Uh, and so it ended up really close to all the other actors. Uh, and here's another one. So we can sort of take a look at that. Uh, ah, no, no, Reagan. Uh, interestingly, I would think of Ronald Reagan more of a politician than an actor, but complex things that uh, he's really more of an actor than a politician. Uh, and uh, so you can kind of explore, uh, you know, your embeddings, uh, you know, maybe some people will know why, you know, what these actors have in common that is different from what these actors here have in common. Uh, you can also search, so we can sort of search for uh, Schwarzenegger. Uh, you can have to search by node label in the uh, next. Did I, what did I do? Yeah. Search for Cruise. So we can find Tom Cruise. Uh, so Tom Cruise is in this cluster over here. And then we can see, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is close by and, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, the embeddings, uh, you know, actually work, uh, you know, really well. And, uh, you know, with KGTK, you know, we've made it so relatively easy to compute embeddings uh, over any of your graphs. And so we, we actually have computed embeddings over a very large subset of Wikidata, and we make those available to folks to download if, uh, if people want. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here and uh, see if people have any questions. Uh, and then, you know, we can sort of cover a few more things given that, you know, we only have two people, uh, Sayed and Kalyani. So, uh, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, you know, we can go over some other parts of the tutorial that we skipped. Uh, you know, this gives you an idea of, of what you can do with the embeddings. I, I don't have a question, I just have a comment. Uh, so some of the features shown in this demo, for example, the computing of the most similar ones that Pedro did with the functions and there's a new feature coming out of the Kaifer query language where you can combine some of these computations directly in a query. So you can, for example, select nodes of a certain type and then find the most similar uh, among them, you know, to between them or to something else directly over the embedding. So that's a new feature coming up where you can use these embedding files sort of more transparently directly within the query language. So you don't have to split this out into separate computations. Uh, okay, any, any other questions? So I thought what we can do, uh, you know, with the time remaining is I can give a little preview of the so network analytics uh, graph and then notebook and then Daniel can sort of uh, end with the so sort of Wikidata uh, analysis. Sure, um, but well, um, I, I just want to, to bring also, so there is only say it because the, the other person is actually, uh, Kalyani is a, is a host. So I would like to ask uh, say it with what, what is that, uh, he would like us to do because basically uh, we are, <laughs> this is a very private tutorial now. <laughs> if, if you are still with us, say it. <laughs> are you there? <laughs> Otherwise it might be worth considering what to do, right? Because, uh, well, we are, we are saving, I mean, we are recording uh, everything but um, what would be the, the right course of action then uh, yeah i don't know uh, 
So uh, what I, I would propose is uh, we, uh, I mean, we, we ask if say it is there and if no one is there, I, I do not see any reason why we should continue. Uh, yeah, then we can mm -hmm. Because if there is no one, then <laughs> I see no, no reason why it should continue. Uh, Daniel actually missed the uh, first session, so it's a bit difficult for me to catch him up. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. So I missed the first session of this tutorial, so it was a bit difficult for me to catch him up. You are muting. Yeah, I was saying that I don't know very well what to do because um, I, I, I mean, um, let, I mean, just to to make sure that we make the most out of everyone's time, right? Uh, I, I, I'm speaking for myself here, um, right? But uh, I would not want to give the tutorial if no one is listening, because I, I also have other things to do, so. Um, uh, it's it's up to the attendees if uh, I'm happy more than happy to give a tutorial if there is at least one attendee <laughs> if there is no attendees um, I'm happy to just uh, well just finalize the session does that make sense to everyone else no I mean if you want to continue then if that's I the consensus, that you know, if there's no audience, then I'd like to see this network analysis. Sorry, I'd like to know about this network analysis. Okay, so uh, okay, we'll do it then. Okay, so let uh, let me start. Uh, so I'm gonna you know click the cells to install everything, as that's what uh, takes the longest time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to show how you can use KGTK. Oh, there's somebody in, uh, coming. Uh, we're going to show how to use KGTK to do various kinds of network analytics on a knowledge graph. And, you know, this is you know, a fun part because, uh, you know, computing things like page rank and so on uh, is not supported by most platforms that uh, do knowledge graph. Uh, you know, that support knowledge graphs. So I think, uh, you know, Neo4j has uh, some capabilities to do network analytics. Uh, I mean, you don't get that uh, from, uh, you know, a Sparkle endpoint. Uh, uh, typically, I don't know if there is one that does it. Uh, so the way that uh, we do it in KGTK uh, is that uh, you know we use a library called uh, Graph Tool, uh, and so Graph Tool is really a, a sort of wonderful library for network analytics. It is super super fast, written in in C or C plus uh, plus, and it has a ton of algorithms. Uh, and so you know, uh, so what we decided in KGTK for many of these things is that you know, we convert the KGTK format, which is very simple, uh, to the format that these external libraries uh, want. Uh, and so, uh, so this is what we did with graph tools. Uh, now, graph tools is kind of uh, difficult to install. Uh, and so even though it will install mostly correctly in Google Colab, not every part of uh, graph tools will work in Google Colab. Uh, but the wonderful thing about uh, graph tools is that I can, for example, compute page rank for all of Wikidata using graph tools. And so what, what it does is really we export the full Wikidata graph or you know, whatever subset you have uh, into graph tools and then run its page rank algorithm. Uh, and so this is how we, you know, say offer page rank for every, you know, 
Wikidata node, uh, you know, uh, for everybody, and it takes a few hours to do it. Uh, and for that, you know, my my little uh, you know USB drive is not enough. My you know you need a larger server with more memory uh, to load to load all of Wikidata. But I'll show you here how we can do this for the R node graph. Uh, so let me uh, continue. Uh, get all the files. Uh, so all our standard setup, uh, load the files into the cache. So in, in every tutorial, we're loading you know, all the R node graph, which is million edges into creating like a new triple store every time it takes a few seconds. Uh, so here's how you compute uh, network metrics. You run the graph statistics command uh, and we're computing page rank. Uh, we're not computing hits. I am telling it that I want to save my page rank uh, values in a new property I call P directed page rank. I'm computing in degree and out degree. Uh, and uh, or we change undirected to true, but I'm still saving this in directed, okay. Uh, so I run it uh, and you know it's computing all these network statistics on the whole graph. And so what is happening is it actually uh, is loading the whole graph from the item file, which is all the, uh, the, the item to item uh, edges. So we're not computing uh, page rank for dates and things like that. And so it took 11 seconds. And it's telling me that none of the visualization commands are gonna work, which is you know, pretty sad, but you know. Uh, so here, you know, we can just so take a look at what we get. And so some random nodes have you know, in degree zero, out degree 18, and some page rank value. And thank God, that's pretty cool. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I can now do my queries and then sort by page rank. Uh, so if I say, you know, give me humans, uh, and then, you know, if I have page rank, I can say, you know, also find the page rank of the human and then order by page rank. And uh, well, turns out Donald Trump has the highest page rank in the R node graph uh, and Barack Obama. And so these nodes have the highest page rank. Uh, and this is very cool because then, you know, whenever I do limit queries and so on, I get to see kind of the, the most important nodes in my graph. And, uh, you know, in the KGTK browser, when you search, we are actually, you know, sorting by a combination of relevance and page rank. And this is why the search works so well. It turns out that's much simpler than the elastic search index that is you know, being made available by Wikidata. Uh, so another thing that uh, we can do in network analytics is create subgraphs. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do here is create a network of the extended family of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, this node, Q2685, that's uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I'm going to traverse all these edges, you know, child, sibling, spouse, unmarried, parent, partner, father, and mother. And I want to do that through the whole graph. And I'm not going to, you know, include relative because relative is just self, sometimes redundant with the other ones in here. Uh, and so this is actually very easy. So there's a reachable nodes command and you can specify what are your routes uh, and then what properties you want to traverse. And then how do you want to sort of capture the results? So I'll run this. So this is running over the whole graph. Uh, and so, you know, this is my root node. Uh, and it says that, you know, extended family, I can reach 72 other nodes. 
Uh, and these are all the people who are in the extended family of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in, in general, I can do this uh, by providing a file of roots. I don't just have to list them here. Uh, and so, uh, so this is nice. So I'm just gonna save it into a file. Uh, so in the tutorials, we always do the same thing. Just you know, have uh, you know the command to see, and then the one that we want to use in the file. Uh, and then I can actually build the graph. So what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna use two graphs: my family members graph and my item graph and I'm gonna combine them. So I'm gonna say from the item graph, I'm gonna retrieve every edge. Uh, and then I'm gonna keep uh, you know, edges that start in a node that appears in the Arnold, the Arnold family. And I'm gonna keep the other end of the edge also in the Arnold family. Uh, and I'm gonna exclude the, you know, this property, which is relative. And uh, so I'm gonna do this. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of an expensive join because it joins on over the whole graph. Uh, but now I have the full family graph. So you know, the, the father of Christopher Lawfer is Peter Lawfer, then the child of John F. Kennedy is Carolyn Kennedy and so on. And all these folks are in the Arnold extended family. So I'm gonna save it to a file. So it's saved. And then I can do analytics. Uh, and so I'm, I want to find paths. So if I give two people in the Arnold file, in the Arnold family, I want to find the path of how they are related. Uh, and so as a test, I'm gonna use, uh, you know, this pairs of nodes, you know, this node to this node, this node to this node, and so on. Uh, and so I put this in a little file. It's you know using this cat command here so that we can do it in the in the notebook without having another file. And, <clears throat> and so I'm I'm gonna just add labels to it so that we can see. So our query nodes are going to be how are Arnold Schwarzenegger and Marilyn Monroe related and John F. Kennedy and Carolyn Kennedy and uh, Victoria Lawford and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, and so there's a paths command in KGTK, which also uses the graph tool library. And so I'm going to input my graph that I want to do the analysis on and then a file that contains the pairs of nodes for which I want to find the paths. Uh, and then I look at the result uh, and the result is coded. Uh, and so we are actually doing something a little bit ugly, but it's very effective. So we say, okay, uh, you know, so we have one path, path P0, uh, and these are the edges in path P0 and it points to the IDs of the edges in the graph. So path zero is this edge, followed by this edge, followed by this edge, and so on. Uh, and, you know, because this is also itself a knowledge graph, it has an edge ID, and so on. Uh, and so then I can do queries. Uh, so here, uh, I'm going to actually in, you know, retrieve those edge IDs from, uh, from the actual graph and, and see my results. So let me just run it. You'll see the results, then we can explain the query. Uh, so the first P0 uh, was, you know, how are Arnold Schwarzenegger and Marilyn Monroe? So Arnold Schwarzenegger is, you know, spouse is Maria Shriver. Maria Shriver is the mother of Eunice, has mother Eunice Kennedy, and Eunice Kennedy has sibling uh, John F. Kennedy, and John F. Kennedy had unmarried partner Marilyn Monroe. So this is how Arnold Schwarzenegger is related to Marilyn Monroe. 
Uh, and so what this query does is it combines the, the Arnold family for, from which we get the node, the edge, the property, and the, the other node. And then you know, from the path, we get the edge ID. Uh, and so this is how you know, we basically construct a new graph that has you know, all, the, all the paths of how they are related. Now, the visualization commands are not going to work here, so I'm not going to run them. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm just going to illustrate uh, what you can do. So here's my family graph. I'm going to export it into, into graph tools format. So I can take my KGTK graph and export it as a graph tool graph. And then I can use the graph to uh, library to do all kinds of uh, analytics on my graph, like finding betweenness and then doing the visualization. And so uh, you get this visualization of kind of the betweenness graph of uh, the, fa the Arnold family. And, and the cool thing is, you know, it only really takes one command uh, export GT to actually be able to use graph tool with any knowledge graph. Uh, and then you know, I can also sort of do this sort of hierarchical visualization of the graph and so on. So, I mean, that it is uh, pretty nice. Uh, I'll end this section with connected components, which we also use fairly often. Uh, so we have our Arnold Oops, there's somebody joined me. Okay. Uh, so we have this sort of knowledge graph. Uh, we have this knowledge graph of the Arnold Schwarzenegger and everything that uh, is related to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you know, we constructed it fairly carefully by you know, traversing links and so on. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I was expecting that the graph would just be all fully connected. Uh, and so we're going to run connected components uh, on that graph, on the Arnold graph. Uh, <clears throat> and so, again, this is just so taking the graph, converting it to graph tools, running connected components and then returning me the results. And then I can see the connected components. Uh, so there's more than one, uh, which uh, I, you know, frankly was surprised about. Uh, so we're gonna uh, do a query where we input the connected components knowledge graph as a graph. So so again, this is kind of to reiterate, uh, every output of a command is itself a knowledge graph. So it, you know, in this case, connected components has node one as the label. So it tells me what is a, a node. Uh, you know, the relation is connected component and it tells me in what component it's in. Uh, and so this is very cool because then you know, basically I can chain all these commands. So, uh, you know, I computed connected components and then I can uh, sort of uh, match the components uh, and, and do a count. So how big is each component? So I just, you know, match the components and then connect, you know, return the, the number of items in each component. And so I see that there's one giant component uh, which I expected, and there's a bunch of, uh, you know, basically disconnected edges uh, in the in the graph, and this must be uh, because of uh, you know some weirdness on how we traverse the relations, and some something got left out, uh, and so you know I I mean this is annoying. So what I'm gonna do here is say, well, you know, we're just going to discard all these of singleton edges. And so what I do is I run a query on my connected components graph. And I say that I'm going to keep only the items that belong to the giant cluster. Uh, and so I do this over the whole graph. 
Uh, and so my graph is just going to have these nodes. So I must have discarded a few nodes. Uh, I'm going to store it in a file. Uh, again, it's going to be a, a valid KGTK file. Uh, and then I'm going to combine my large cluster with the items. And what I'm going to do is basically keep from my original graph only the nodes that belong to this cluster. Uh, and so, you know, this is something we do very often when we extract subgraphs by, you know, first selecting nodes and then going to the big graph and say, well, get me all the, no all the edges that relate any pair of those nodes. Uh, and so I get, you know, 3 million edges, you know, no, 393,000 edges. Uh, and so if I compare this to what I had originally, I discarded you know, 13 edges. Uh, and so I can save my large cluster uh, into a file. Uh, and uh, and again, this part doesn't work in Google Colab, uh, but I'm going to show what you can do. Uh, so then you can visualize the graph. And so this is how the graph looks like. Uh, so we see that you know, there's kind of a one big blob in the middle and then uh, things you know, going out. And you know, this is kind of expected from the way the Arnold Schwarzenegger graph is constructed, uh, where you basically start, you know, you first, we first got all the people, places, organizations, and movies, and creative works. And then we start with Arnold Schwarzenegger and go, you know, like seven levels deep uh, to find nodes. Uh, and so, you know, these ones uh, over here are the ones that you kind of get uh, into the frontier. Uh, and so, because we're going out to the frontier and we're not traversing it anymore, uh, is in part the reason why the embeddings don't work super well. So the embeddings are work are going to work reasonably well for this part here, but uh, for all these nodes that are outside in this periphery. Uh, it's unlikely that the embeddings will work very well because, you know, when you get to these nodes over here in the periphery, uh, you know, they're just not going to have any neighbors. Uh, and so, you know, that's, uh, that's it for, you know, so we, we did this part of the tutorial too. Uh, and uh, so I guess the last part then is you know, the Wikidata study. All right. Um, so shall I, shall I get started? Yeah. Okay. That way we will give you a break because you have been presenting <laughs> most of the time. Um, all right. I hope you can see my screen. Let me try and put the chat also visible in case anyone has any questions. All right. All right, so uh, most of the session has been uh, an interactive session. This is a little bit more of a show and tell session. And what I'm going to be telling you is two different types of analysis that we have done with Wikidata thanks to KGTK. So for those who have joined recently, uh, I'm going to go very quickly over this, but uh, I mean, it's kind of repeating what Pedro, Hans, and Amandip have already said about Wikidata. We selected Wikidata because it's a free collaborative multilingual database. It's one of the biggest knowledge graph and it holds more than 100 million items. So we wanted to see uh, as part of uh, uh, we wanted to see a uh, kind of its evolution as part of many things, right? And uh, 
this is one of the analysis that we did uh, with Wikidata. And as Pedro said in the uh, beginning of the presentation, there are three main ways of accessing the contents in Wikidata. One is through the Sparkle endpoint, which we can you can access in this URL over here. And it's great because you can do queries very quickly, but it doesn't have a lot of support for complex queries, right? And as Pedro has shown in many of their, uh, the notebooks throughout the session, um, many of the interesting queries that we want to perform with Wikidata fail when uh, you use the public Sparkle endpoint. Uh, another way of addressing these more complex queries is just go to the dumps, and the dumps can be accessed in this URL over here. Uh, there are two types of dumps. If you go to the JSON format, it, it's around 100 gigabytes. And if you go through the total representation, it's around 100 gigabytes compressed. Of course, it depends on the type of compression. If you, if you select this one, the VC2 compression, um, you will uh, gain a little bit more gigabytes, but at the cost of time when you uncompress the data. And of course, the problem of this is that uh, uh, you need a lot of time to load this uh, into a Sparkle endpoint, and uh, you need a quite a powerful server to do so as well. So, um, uh, uh, in this analysis, we have been using KGTK, most of the commands shown here. Again, uh, I'm just showing all this because I, I have seen a, a shift in people that were coming and going through the session. So, I hope this is not repetitive. Um, and and uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, two of the analyses that we have done. One is uh, analyzing the evolution of Wikidata by looking at the differences of more than 300 dumps of the knowledge graph. And in the second analysis, we have done a Wikidata quality analysis by looking at how a constrained validation works uh, and can be validated within the full knowledge graph. So let me start with the first one. Why look at the evolution of Wikidata in particular? Well, uh, we are extending it uh, for 2020, full 2021 and 2022, but um, the initial scope of the analysis has been seven years since the Wikidata inception in 2014. And we wanted to see how two large knowledge graphs get populated. So basically see whether there are new classes that are still being added. When were classes added and new properties added? Uh, analyze whether uh, terms were stable in the knowledge graph. And uh, well, also analyze the, whether highly edited classes are more, more or less co connected by calculating their page rank. We also wanted to analyze the timeliness of large knowledge graph. That is how much uh, time do, the, do changes take to, uh, to appear in the graph uh, since they happen in the real world. So for example, if uh, Barack Obama uh, becomes president at one year, how long does it actually take for that fact to appear in the knowledge graph? And one of the challenges that we first <laughs> saw was uh, the data collection. Of course, I have shown the pages where you can access some of the Wikidata dumps. But the problem is that some of these pages contain only the last few months. And if you want to go really back, uh, you have to go to the Internet Archive, where fortunately they have made it now a mirror uh, for Wikidata dumps. However, the Wikidata, sorry, the Internet Archive has gaps of a couple of years, and we found that there were a lot of inconsistent gaps in there. And we had to reach out to the community for help. And fortunately, some members of the community had uh, all these missing dumps uh, saved somewhere. And we, we managed to download everything and collect uh, 311 data set dumps that go usually, they are usually weekly, but sometimes they are bi-weekly because not, not, uh, they are not available always. And in total, it's a database of more than 15 terabytes compressed. So what we did is uh, for calculating the evolution of uh, the Wikidata uh, across time, we used KGTK and imported, as we have seen many times throughout this session, from, uh, well, first one from JSON to the KGTK format with a command that I'll show in the next slide. Then we sorted, calculated deltas between uh, two different 
TOMPS, and we uh, counted classes and instances, calculated the page rank and halves, and compressed the results. Of course, we faced some challenges because um, the Wikidata JSON format has been changing through the history of Wikidata, and there were sometimes errors within the dumps, like with uh, the way some literals were encoded and so on and so forth. And here in this slide, I'm showing a little bit some of the scripts that we have uh, we have been using. I'm not going to go into the details of what does the bash script said, but the important thing is that with a couple of very simple scripts, we have been able to do most of the analysis, right? And and uh, Pedro and, and Hans and Amandip have been showing these very long uh, notebooks where you have everything well explained and structured. But, uh, well, in my case, for doing this massive analysis, this is no different, right? So just by using a couple of commands, I was using, I was able to do most of the things that we were interested in. In this case, maybe the biggest command here, just due to the amount of the options, is the Wikidata import command. But then you can see over here in the bottom of the slide with that I'm just sorting the, the dump to produce a new file. And all the results, again, uh, they are produced as a mini knowledge graph as these TSB files. And here, I think this is the uh, command that I'm using to retrieve just Wikibase items from Wikidata so I can filter, so I can filter everything and calculate the page rank, uh, which is one of the commands that possibly takes most of the time. So I'm just going to show some of the results because I said this was a little bit more of a show and tell session. This is the evolution of the most popular properties. Let me pause this for a second. And you can see, I'm just uh, checking. Uh, I'm here, I think I'm showing 20. But uh, in total, I think we have 50 cons considered. We have 50 properties considered in total. So if a new property arises over here, it means that that was uh, one of the 50 most pro used properties as well. And what it means over here, this number over here means the year, the month, and the, and the day, right? So you can see that it goes by very fast because we have been uh, plotting just the differences from dump to dump. Um, so basically it's 2016, 2017, right? And you can see that some point in, whoop, let me, sorry, let me just wait a little bit. Uh, so you can see at some point in 2017, uh, the, the knowledge graph, uh, a, a lot of people, sorry, they dump into Wikidata a lot of articles. And you can see that suddenly the amount of uh, authors or name strings for uh, articles, scientific articles, just increases very, very significantly, right? And I think that it, it stays that way until the very end. Uh, you can see things like DOI, title, publication dates. Suddenly, it's like a, a lot of articles got put into Wikidata, and, and they kind of bias very significantly the knowledge graph towards uh, citation networks. But it's still it's very, very interesting. See, by 2021, it's the site's work is what it gets most of the time. And you can see here, the 93 million was the amount of instances that we have in Wikidata. Uh, by uh, by the time I finished this, that was it by 2021. Um, so uh, see, see, similarly, you get like the you can see like the evolution of the most popular classes in Wikidata. Uh, again, the number means a uh, year, month, and and day. So you can see that day by day, they uh, each of the classes continue growing. Sometimes you can see that Wikimedia category pops in and out because uh, it's something that they filter out from some of the dumps. And um, you can see, uh, as I was saying before, that by 2017, scholarly article just gets massively added into the Wikidata uh, knowledge graph. And most of the other, of the other uh, uh, categories just fail in comparison to the amount of articles, right? That's the reason why in some of the profiling work that we have been doing, the first thing that we do is kind of removing scientific articles because sometimes it's not something that we may be interested in having in our uh, knowledge graphs, right? Anyway, this is just a little bit uh, a curiosity to see uh, the evolution of the knowledge graph. Um, 
uh, well, let me go to the to the next slide. So then you can also see uh, things like the evolution of entities with the biggest knowledge graph. Again, sorry, with the biggest page rank. Um, and you see things like human are the things that are most connected. Uh, male and Wikimedia disambiguation page are very high there. So it's still interesting, interesting, interesting things to see. So this one. This was in the beginning when Wikidata was just created, and this was by the end of the analysis, which is almost 2021, where um, English becomes uh, kind of the most one of the most significant entities according to the, uh, its page rank, just because the amount of articles published in English. Again, you can see here taxon article, Armenian Soviet encyclopedia, right? These are just things that are are, are getting dumped into the graph. So um one of the things that we also wanted to see was the lag as i was saying which is the delay between something happening in the real world and that thing have, uh, appearing in wikidata by we did that by looking at the qualifiers and the date when those qualifiers had been added into uh, wikidata and we can see that most of the things that are added into wikidata are kind of quite timely, which is uh, good news, right? So most of the statements with a qualifier are added and the lag is, is quite low, which is uh, very good. Of course, there are things that are describing, uh, are describe, are describing events of uh, many, many years ago, and that's okay as well. But in that case, we, we don't consider them super timely. And we also look at how alive is Wikidata, because one could claim, oh yeah, um, Many people just added a, a bunch of stuff in the beginning, but then since then, maybe the growth of the graph has not been uh, continuous. But we can see that, that that's not true, right? That, uh, of course, there is a significant gap between the first and the second year. This is the amount of classes that were firstly populated. Um, just note here that we are only considering the classes with instances because Wikidata has a taxonomy of millions of classes um that may not have any instance so we just by looking at those classes and properties that are being used when is the first year when they were uh, populated or used actually tells us whether there are new types of things being added into which data and this is kind of true remember that for 2021 i think we stopped in january 2021 and therefore 2021 cannot be considered um part of this graph but you can see that the growth is more or less consistent. And uh, well, we have uh, more results, but uh, they will be coming in, a, in a next paper. Moving on, the uh, other type of analysis that we did is uh, a Wikidata quality analysis by looking, among other things, into uh, the constraints defined in the knowledge graph. Oh, by the way, I see that new people are coming up to the, to the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, stop me at any time. So in order to assess Wikidata quality, the first thing that we uh, kind of analyzed was, OK, what does it actually uh, mean to, to be something of quality in Wikidata? So we started looking at some of the complaints by the community. And there is an excellent presentation by Lydia Pinsner, who is one of the heads of the project of the Wikidata project. And uh, she basically was saying that uh, crowdsourced the data is great, but the problem is that many people have a conflicting views that when put together in Wikidata, well, there, there are some inconsistencies, right? So you have a mix up of meta levels, there are conceptual ambiguity, there are something, you have sometimes a messy upper ontology that means that, uh, I don't know that an instrument can be a consequence of an action. So some things that really, really don't make a lot of sense, but that are when you start going up in the hierarchy, you see very weird things, right? Sometimes you have also a, a lot of classes that are subclasses or another, and sometimes there are cycles, which is a little bit uh, impossible as well. But uh, that's what happens when also you bring different people with different ways of modeling the world. And uh, that's what we, part of this is what we kind of try to measure, 
right? We also looked into the constraint violations, which I'll explain in a little bit, and things like duplicate entities. So we had seven questions that we wanted to, to answer, and uh, this is actually uh, explained in this paper over here. All the resources has, are available online. So if you want to know more, um, I would like to encourage you to, to just see this paper. But in, in general, I'm just going for the sake of time to go very quickly over some of these questions that we wanted to analyze. So basically, oh, um, are things being deduplicated in Wikidata? Can, we, can the community actually distinguish between the difference between classes and instances? Because sometimes there are a lot of mess ups, right? Uh, are property types and value types respected? That means the domain and range of properties are actually respected by the community. Can we detect maybe missing triples? Are, constraint, are constraints correct? Because sometimes some of the constraints, the problem is that they are too restrictive for the data that we have in the graph. And also we looked at the statements that get deprecated and whether um, constraint violations are getting fixed or not across time. So the way we did this is that we looked at three different data sources. We looked at uh, the statements that were permanently deleted. Since we had all the evolution of Wikidata from our previous analysis, we just had to look at those statements that had been removed and never been added again. So that actually tells you a lot of information because um, it tells you a lot of the things that have been uh, deleted uh, because of redirections or how thing, how constraints have actually helped uh, improve the knowledge graph. Another thing that we look at is the deprecated statements. Those are the statements that are still in Wikidata. They are not deleted. It's just that the community has reached another agreement about a fact and the statement stays there as a deprecated statement. An example that is very illustrative about this is whether Pluto is a planet or not. Pluto stopped being a planet according to the community around 2009, if I'm correct. And after 2009, Pluto is not a planet anymore. So that statement after 2009 is deprecated. And then we looked at different constraint violations, which are uh, the typical ones from semantic web, no? So symmetric, inverse, etc. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you how we did this uh, very quickly. We use uh, KGTK. Um, if, uh, for those who are not very familiar with the Wikidata data model, this is the reification model that Wikidata has for one statement. So for one statement, which may be uh, Barack Obama is a person, you have all these other triples over here to add qualifiers about that statement. What we did, uh, is that we took the deprecated statements, those, that means those statements with a qualifier that uh, one of the qualifiers is the rank and the rank of the statement is deprecated. So we took uh, those statements, with, uh, which I think there are like 10 million statements. And this is how we created the remove the statements, the permanently the remove the statements from the full 311 corpus of uh, dumps that we had. It's just a couple of KGTK commands, right? And for the constraint violations, we use KGTK Kaifer uh, using queries uh, very similar to what you would do in Spark. First, um, before also going into the detail, I have to explain how do constraints are represented in Wikidata. They don't use all and uh, they don't they use RDF, but they have this way of representing constraints in which each constraint is machine readable. You can, you can go, it has a definition of what the constraint is, and uh, it has a series of, of classes that the constraint applies to. So for example, depends on what the constraint is. So for example, this is a type constraint, which is very similar to the RDFS domain. Basically, it's telling you that the domain of the property with this constraint must be a person or a narrative entity or so on and so forth. I am looking at a particular property in this case, which is occupation. So the domain of occupation is person among other things. And usually they also have exceptions. So the uh, exception in this case 
is a prescriber. So for prescriber, if someone has the this this uh, this domain as as uh, as the occupation property, this type of constraint it does not apply, right? So just by looking into this, uh, we can kind of uh, create uh, a query where we are basically uh, stating, hey, give me all the things um, from, from the knowledge graph where uh, it can be any of the expected parents or the subject is in exceptions. And the only problem with this is that you have to do a different query for each type of new constraint. There are, I think, around um, uh, 35 or 36 types of constraints, but for the OR analysis, we looked into just five types, which are type, value type, these are domain, range, items require statement, which indicates that every time you have A, you must have B. For example, if there is a death date, there should be a, a born date as well. And then symmetric and inverse constraints, which are very similar to the ones in semantic web. So basically the way that we are doing this is that we are kind of filtering everything uh, that is correct. And then we are uh, getting all the knowledge graph and filtering the ones that are correct to derive the ones that are incorrect. This is just like uh, how we would do a, a, a query, a series of queries with KTTK. And the interesting thing here is that we found that uh, looking at, at some of these uh, results from our analysis, more than 2 million redirected our nodes have been redirected, uh, affecting 2 point, 20, almost 21, almost 21.3 million statements. So one third of the removed statements were actually redirected, which means that, well, the duplication is, uh, is at least there is an effort to, to correct it. Um, regarding the uh, whether the community can distinguish classes from instances, we looked at the deleted statements and we saw that there had been a lot of changes uh, from entities going from instance to class and from class to instance, right? Uh, actually, there were, uh, I think, more going from, uh, from class to instance than from instance to class, so, uh, which means that, that, well, the community is aware and they are trying to fix uh, some of these problems. And we also looked at the domain and range constraints. We see that most of the uh, violations occur in constraints that are not mandatory. There, I, I didn't explain this in detail, but some types of constraints are kind of suggested um, uh, and others are mandatory. But still from the mandatory constraints, we found more than 40,000 statements that are wrong, which is significant, right? And uh, we created this beautiful graph. Um, uh, actually, this was a part of the work by uh, Kartik Shinoi, who came up with this kind of representation. And I think it's, it's pretty neat, where each of the dots of this, uh, uh, of this graph is a different property. And it basically, you are seeing how many instances that have this property are actually doing a violation. So all the things over here are constraint violation. So all the things over here are very bad. Um, and all the things over here are pretty good because there is a low rate. And this leads to the question on whether some con constraints are correct. Because if you see that 100% of the instances using that constraint are violating that constraint, maybe the problem are not in all the instances, but in the constraint itself that is too restrictive, right? So this also helps to, to actually check this kind of things. Um, and, and then uh, about the what the things get deprecated, we saw that uh, in, interestingly, uh, many things in the astronomy domain are going through constant revisions. This makes sense because it's a scientific domain where basically all the top five classes with instances and properties are, uh, that are being um, deprecated are from that domain. So it means that there is a, a lot of healthy discussion in the community and that, uh, well, science is also an evolving field. And then regarding uh, constraint violations getting fixed, um, we, we see that there is a significant, so we did this by, by looking how many of the deleted statements 
were actually violated, got violating constraints. And we see that many of the things that have been deleted were actually uh, wrong uh, const constraints violations. This means that, well, there is a, a trend towards fixing some of these constraints, but still many things may be still there wrong in Wikidata. And you can see here from the mandatory uh, from the mandatory category, which is perhaps the one that is more important, many type constraints, which is the uh, domain, uh, the domain constraints are getting fixed, have been fixed, sorry. And uh, finally, well, just to end up a little bit of this show and tell session, you may think that, oh, well, yeah, running all this analysis may take a lot of time, a long time. So uh, there are more than 8,000 properties and many of them, um, have different constraint viol uh, violations, sorry, constraints defined over there. So even though we didn't take the 8,000 properties, we took all the, only those properties that were not external IDs because we, did, we were not interested in external IDs. We see that uh, more or less with KGTK, we have a median of two minutes per constraint. Of course, there are some constraints where it goes up into two hours to run the full constraint violation. But still, if, if it's, this is something that is meant to be run offline, maybe once, once a month or once a week, this is pretty reasonable time because if less than, than a few hours, you just can validate the full, uh, uh, full constraint violation in Wikidata. And if you want to see more details, we have now a journal paper, that, which is an, a little bit of an extension of all this analysis, which is available over here. But um, what is also very easy to do is just go and and go through the Google Colab. I am not going to run the Google the, the notebook just for the sake of time, but I am going to show you that uh, you can do a very easily a constraint validation example um, using the graph that Pedro, Amandip, and Hans have been using uh, previously in the session. So we, oops. It, it appears. So uh, it's in the same GitHub repository. I think it's a notebook number seven. And uh, it, it runs with a, a constraint on a location uh, following the example shown in the slides. So I am going to skip all the setup because this first you have to install KGTK, you have to import everything, uh, you have to download the files very similar to what they have been doing right, and then load them into the cache. And then uh, we just uh, apply KGTK queries to, to see some of the things that exist on this graph. So for example, I'm just printing here all the locations and their frequency in the data set to see the types of locations that we have in the graph. So you can see that London appears many times, Los Angeles appears many times, this makes sense because many actors are from these locations. And moving on, then I uh, well we print additional information about about the locations, uh, which I mean you can explore a little bit more in detail by running it yourself. And uh, the the constraint violation that we are looking is the value type constraint, which is similar to the range. Uh, in in here, if you go to location and you see the value type constraint, it means that for uh, the class location you have to, uh, I mean, locations have to be an instance of any of these classes, right? So if a, a location is from class location, it makes sense, or from a mythical place or from orbit, ex with the exception of these three instances. So Earth does, uh, does not have to comply with any, or doesn't have to be from any of these classes above. So, um, the first thing that we do uh, in order to do this is a little bit of profiling, which is what uh, Pedro and Amandip have been showing before, right? We just filter all the labels, all the properties with location and we save them in a file. And then, uh, well, uh, we do a little bit, a little bit of exploration. I just put it in a file called claims.tsv. And then uh, I do the representation of the constraint violation query into in, in Kaifer, which basically means, hey, give me uh, anything that uh, does uh, where the range of the property it has to be one of these classes. And one of these classes, I mean, if you look into 
uh, what each of these classes means is probably each of these classes here, like one, one, seven, three, three, four, two, nine, three is, is uh, has to be one of these ones, right? Um, ah, yeah, here it is, right? So this one I think is location. Uh, nine, two, three, it should be nine, two, three. Yeah, this one is, this one. So basically, since this information is queryable, you can do actually a query to KGDK, uh, to the Wikidata endpoint and uh, re uh, retrieve all this information. And actually we did this to, to create the, uh, to create this query automatically. And the node has to be in Q2, which is Earth or the other one. And then by executing this query, we get all the things that are correct. And then we just filter our knowledge graph uh, without the, sorry, not the full knowledge graph, the, the P276 file with the claims. We filter the ones that are correct. And then we, we are left with the ones that are incorrect which are here. And uh, these are the locations that are called within the Arnold knowledge graph to violate that constraint. Uh, that constraint. So for example, we see here um, that a Q79, which is the Vilnius University Institute for uh, whatever, uh, has a location German instead of Germany, which is a typo in the, uh, knowledge graph. I'm sure, I think that I fixed this one by going to Wikidata and changing it in, in, uh, after looking into this. So you may not find it in Wikidata anymore, but here you can also see some things that are, could be a little questionable, right? From a modeling point of view. So um, it, here it says that cooking, the location is a workplace, which I'm not sure. Uh, so it kind of makes sense, but I'm not sure this is intended um, uh, this is the proper use of the of the property location, right? Or the bed, the location is bedroom. I'm not sure that this is the intended usage of the property location, and actually that's why it's flagged as a constraint violation. All right. So, and this more or less concludes the the analysis. You are welcome to try this notebook uh, because it's in the same place where the others are, and uh, I just didn't want to run everything for rerun everything for the sake of time, but I mean, I've I run it, I think I, this is run yesterday evening. So you're welcome to do so yourself as well. And uh, now I'm happy to take any questions if you have some. I see no comments in the chat, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, Pedro, it's all yours. Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, so I see only Andreas is here. So, but I don't know if he is actually here or just logged in. <laughs> yeah, this has been a very, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> hi, Andreas, <laughs> a very private tutorial that we were saying before. How are you? Uh, good. Um, here in Lyon, actually. Um, can you hear me? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, nice to see what you guys are doing. Uh, it's always uh, interesting. Always uh, the next thing, the next little thing. So uh, uh, keep up the good work. I would say. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah. I mean, uh, interesting. I was talking to Lydia about all these, uh, you know, classes like scholarly articles that are appearing in Wikidata and so on, which is, you know. So the problem is, you know, there's like 30 million or 40 million scholarly articles in Wikidata, which is a lot. Uh, but, you know, Microsoft Academic Graph has like a million articles. Uh, and so, uh, and we actually did a, K, you know, a, a Knowledge Graph Toolkit version of Mac, which is 10 times larger than Wikidata. Uh, and so like, you know, questioning what is the point of putting these things in Wikidata uh, because it's a lot of them, but they are not nearly complete or out up to date. So as data, they're not as useful. You know, if you really want to work with that data, you have to go get it somewhere else. Uh, and so cluttering all the graph with all that data is kind of, uh, you know, of questionable utility. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this is, you know, some of the things that we see, I mean, same thing with, 
movies. So there are a lot of movies in Wikidata, uh, but IMDb has a million movies. Uh, Wikidata has less than 10% of that. Uh, and, and, you know, like rivers, probably Wikidata has every river, which is great. Uh, but, you know, many things, Wikidata is kind of, I mean, so notability, I don't know if notability is as useful for data as it is for encyclopedic pages that you go look up to read about them. Uh, so kind of interesting things we discover as we kind of keep digging into Wikidata. Uh, <clears throat> so the the other interesting thing, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Andrea, sorry. Uh, the other interesting thing I thought was the classes instances um, separation, where Daniel, you said basically they change it from classes to instances and vice versa. Um, so I'm not sure whether there is the right way of uh, seeing the world in terms of that class instance distinction. So, um, the, yeah. A few years back, I thought there is one way of viewing the world, but by now I'm a little bit older and wiser. And depending on what application you have in mind, you might want to model something as a class and as an instance. So and I, uh, this showing up in Wikidata, I think is also an interesting uh, bit of information. Well, and in Wikidata, they can be both, right? So something can be an instance and a class. Um, but but still, even in those cases, we we still saw that there was a shift, most most mostly between from classes to instances and by, vice versa. And I think that maybe yeah, that maybe some people uh, get confused in the beginning and they put everything as a class, and then later they it may get refined by someone else in the community. I mean, this is kind of why SCOS was invented because you have hierarchies and maybe you think they're kind of like class hierarchies, but not quite. And <laughs> so Wikidata has a lot of kind of qualified instance of and subclass of statements uh, that are basically saying, well, you know, this is kind of a subclass, but you know, here's more information about how to interpret it. Uh, and then like there's parent taxon, which is a completely separate hierarchy. So, you know, like the relationships between different kinds of animals are not in the subclass hierarchy uh, because that community decided something else. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. You know, there's no one way to do it, no? Uh, and the challenge is, well, you get this big thing, you know, and trying to discover, okay, so how is it done for this thing? <laughs> yeah, what also, what also struck me was um, that basically you, you find some issues that I would expect uh, to find in, Wiki, uh, in, in linked data, where you have different people contributing uh, knowledge, but in a, in a way, Wikidata is big enough and diverse enough that these uh, things crop up there, like uh, cycles in subclass hierarchies and, and things like that. So you would think if you have a centralized system, you can uh, prevent these from happening and only in an open system like linked data, you get those, but even in Wikidata, which is now big enough apparently and diverse enough that, you, uh, that uh, these issues crop up. Yeah, I mean, they don't have the, technology and resources to actually verify these things. I mean, verifying cycles is not so hard, no? <clears throat> but it requires a lot of computation so that they cannot do as people edit. Uh, so this is kind of the, the thing. And so, you know, we've been trying to help them by computing things online and now they have a way for us to contribute it back so that it appears as to-do items for editors. Uh, like say, you know, here's a cycle, you know, or here's a constraint violation, uh, you know, 
maybe you want to take a look at this, but uh, you know, we haven't done our part. They did their part. We, it's on our thing to actually now contribute this, you know, tags back and so, but there's no alternative. So trying to make Wikidata better is, uh, so I have a question for you. So, so what do you think is gonna happen with so DBpedia versus Wikidata? Okay. Um, is this recorded? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, think, yeah, I think I think recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think uh, Wikidata is now has now taken over DBpedia, and um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure how long DBpedia. Uh, it's it was a very useful resource. But I'm not sure how much longer it'll it'll uh, stick around. Um, have Have you? Do you have an idea how, in terms of size, I think Wikidata is now much bigger than uh, DBpedia, right? Because DBpedia is based on 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 Wikipedia, and yeah. So, I mean, for for educational purposes, I think DBpedia is still nice because they have um not numbers but they have like real world identify or, or like um, understandable identifiers like for properties and for uh, for uh, the entities uh, but apart from that i think um, yeah wikidata is the way to go and i don't really see why dbpedia like what dbpedia offers over wikidata i, I don't know what your opinions are on that yeah, I mean, I share your opinion. I, I see a lot of papers. I mean, a few years ago, most papers that use knowledge graph data used DBpedia, but now it has flipped and most papers are using Wikidata. And so more Wikidata benchmarks and data sets are appearing. Uh, and I mean, our experiments show that the, Wiki, the DBpedia data is super noisy uh despite what i've seen in other papers so philip did has a part of the tutorial where we're trying to get spouse data from uh dbpedia you know all the spouse relations and try to add them to uh to wikidata and you know we see all kinds of things appearing as spouses that are not people uh that are kind of random strings <laughs> uh and so yeah it's uh you know i mean it's in a sense not surprising you know parsing uh is hard yeah i mean actually in fact for any property that we looked into hi andreas uh for any property that we looked into i think without exception we always saw all the data types always like if you look for a spouse you get lots of numbers you get lots of strings many empty strings many strings that are not even letters but like all kind of special characters um things get splitted in weird ways and like all kind of things i mean it's just automatic extraction and it seems like it's not very well curated after yeah i was when when i talked to danny in the early days and he said he just want to have humans editing wikidata uh, i thought that won't work but uh, now actually the success uh, proves him right yeah that you get much better data even if it's a lot of work but it's split across so many people so then it's uh, yeah i i fix little things you fix little things and then over time uh, the whole uh, data set gets gets better so i i yeah I, I i'm surprised by that development i thought nobody is going to put manual effort in uh, to 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 edit uh, the wiki data but it's so many people and over time i think the quality is actually getting quite quite good but uh, petro what you said actually this completeness thing uh, we also see that so when we take for example german companies um and take them out of wiki data there are some gaps in there it's not really sort of uniform 
um, in terms of the depth of the descriptions. Um, but um, yeah, I think over time uh, that that will uh, will be addressed hopefully as well. So that uh, that it's the coverage is more it's it's more uh, complete basically. Yeah, I think most of the problems come from licensing uh, because a lot of the data that people could add is not CC0. And so maybe they'll have to sort of figure out a way to have, you know, this kind of separate wiki data that have different licenses or uh, so that people can write bots that add more data. Uh, or, I mean, they want to do this all federated wiki data, which may work well where they, I think the idea is to have kind of a centralized definition of all the properties and maybe the classes, and then, you know, this all federated data. So like oh, somebody okay. could put Microsoft academic graph or, or the new version of it uh, into a separate thing and then you really have a lot of the papers. Yeah, I mean, you can do real uh, so citation analysis or whatever, which you can't really do yeah. in Wikidata. Yeah. And the, when, you, when you start breaking it up, the question becomes, what do you put in the core and what do you put in the other parts? Um, so we have, we have uh, that question currently, actually, to... Um, where we want to add specific data, um, but we don't want to put it into Wikidata, but into a separate instance of uh, like Wikibase instance. But then the question is like, do you do you create new uh, Wikidata entities and then just link them from your separate one? Or what properties do you put in one and what properties do you put in the other? And uh, this, these types of questions that, yeah, become, I don't know, interesting at least. Uh, I'm not sure what the solution is, but uh, yeah, there is, um, there, there, are, there are open questions. And I think the Wikidata ecosystem is actually a nice one because the tools are there, uh, the data is there, and you can start playing around like your experiment, what you've done uh, sh shows that. Yeah, I mean, we convert everything to KGTK and then we just have separate files, uh, you know, and that's how KGTK is designed. And, you know, I wish they make it much faster to load data into Wikibase. I mean, this is kind of the big bottleneck, you know, loading Wikibase is extremely slow. Uh, I think they're working on it. So you could really create like super large Wikibases. And also another problem with uh, with Wikibase is that every time you load something, it changes all the identifiers. So none of the queries that uh, that work for one instance of Wikibase will work on the other. And, the, and then you need to figure out the mapping between uh, your instances and Wikidata or whatever. And that uh, that's very annoying. <laughs> oh, so P31 is not going to be P31. <laughs> so, I mean, that is nuts, no? Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, maybe maybe they preserve it for P31 or something, but all the other nodes and, and also the rest of the properties change. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, that's a nightmare. It's designed to be sequential. <laughs> so things get a number based on when they get loaded. Uh, I mean, they made the numbering thing so that it's multilingual, no? There's no preferred language. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could use UUIDs as well, but then you always get like 64-bit, 128-bit, which is also not easy to type. So I, I think in the beginning, they thought a lot about um, these identifiers. I think there was also the idea of using hex identifiers or, 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 or um, characters and numbers, but then you could create identifiers that have offensive meaning in some language um, with, the, with the characters, right? So then at some point they, they said, well, we just do numbers and sequential. Um, then it keeps it small for Q 
and Q2 and uh, all the other things and um, yeah, the, the important things are small then. Yeah, I mean, we noticed for performance reasons that having small everything is makes a big difference. Your, your caches are smaller, everything is smaller and this makes a big difference. I think Freebase uses hex, no? I mean, not hex, you know, characters and numbers. So they have really short identifiers. Yeah, which is very, very nice. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, of the, the if you want the full featured, uh, the full feature set, uh, you, you use linked data. There you can basically uh, do the integration, you can do the distribution, uh, you can uh, name your own properties, name your own uh, I, URI schemes, uh, but yeah, that's a bit too powerful, I think, for, for a lot of people, so yeah. Well, it was nice having a sort of closing discussion with you. Nice to see you. So hope uh, that we'll actually cross oh, paths somewhere. So are you in at, real life? Yes. Are you at the conference? Is the conference at your place or? No, it's in uh, France, which is oh. not too far from where, where I'm at. So um, and I was one of the organize one uh, track chair. So I got um, the chance to go on site. And Are I there a lot it. of people there? No, uh, 20, 30. It's not, not many. Yeah, I don't know how willing people are still to travel far for conferences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's starting, hope, uh, thankfully. So ESWC will be my next conference. I look forward to that one as well. Oh, okay. I don't think we're attending it. I do we have I don't think we have papers there or do we? No. What? I don't know. And not oh, as far we, as I know. We, we we don't we don't try to send to ESWC that much anymore. Uh we send to ISWC, but uh mostly to NLP conferences, triple AI. We get very few citations from ESWC. So we send their the papers after we cannot get them accepted at AAA. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so we've kind of branched out and are sending to the so main AI conferences, uh, and then a lot of the NLP conferences and so related conferences. We, we do a lot of work now with, you know, machine learning, language models, embeddings. Uh, I mean, this is kind of the core of our work. And there's many other ventures for that. I just heard of, so sorry, I just heard from uh, from Kalyani that we are running 10 minutes over. So just just mentioning that, so probably we should wrap up in a minute or so. Yeah, I mean, Andres, you're one of the sort of uh, main, you know, ESWC people. Maybe you can sort of uh, steer them into being more friendly towards the kind of uh, neural way of thinking. Uh, I, I'll discuss I'll discuss that with uh, with uh, the attendees when I'm when I'm uh, there. So but I, I, I remember that uh, the machine learning parts or the tracks were always a little bit contentious in terms of acceptance and uh, people were quite critical about the papers there. So, but uh, I, I'll make sure to mention that uh, in my discussions. And uh, let's see if maybe maybe there is some uh, good development coming out. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. 
th th thanks for letting me know. I'll, I'll, I'll put that into the discussions. I mean, it's not just us. I mean, a lot of the people who we work with, they don't consider sending their knowledge graph papers there, even though they are knowledge graph papers. They're starting with Wikidata uh, and, and doing machine learning, embeddings, knowledge graph completion, you know, and so on. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't, the SWC doesn't seem to be a friendly audience for that kind of work. And I think that's a mistake. I don't think that work's going to go away. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take that in in um, tomorrow discussion. So, uh, thanks, Peter. Thanks, guys. Nice, nice okay. seeing you and good luck with your stuff. You Thank too. you. Thank, Thank you. you.